Um, we can begin, um, and I'll begin by making the usual announcement in relation to our streaming of, of meetings. So, just to uh, let everyone in the chamber know, the Economic and Community Development Committee, that is this committee, and the Finance and Business Services Committee, that is the next committee, public meetings are streamed live and recorded for publishing on the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken at this meeting. That means that your presence at and any or all contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or publicly published by the Council, including transferring outside Australia. So be warned, you're on candid camera. <laughs> Members, I um, declare the meeting of the Economic and Development Committee open and begin with the acknowledgement of country. The Economic and Develop the Economic and Community Development Committee acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect the cult their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We have uh, no apologies in leave of absence. Um, so which brings us to item three on the agenda, confirmation of the minutes. Can I have someone move the minutes please? Moved by um, Councillor Clarehan, seconded by the Lord Mayor. All those in favour of that? That's carried. Um, public forum. We have no public forum and there is no verbal report from me as chair. So moving to item six, the selection and appointment of the deputy chair. Can I have somebody? <laughs> I understand the councillor uh, called Bill, who's currently our deputy chair, um, retains an interest in continuing in that role. And um, oh, I'm happy to nominate her. Thank you. Um, so, if she's yeah. interested. Yeah. Yeah. So, do we have any other nominees? No. So that's. So, if somebody could move the. Um, the, thank you. Moved by Councillor Clarahan and seconded by Councillor Vershaw. Um, can I put that? All those in favour? That's carried. Congratulations, Councillor. Thank you too for your ongoing support to me and to this committee. That moves us to items for adoption on block. So I'll do a call over members and shout if there's anything you want pulled out. Obviously, uh, I met Councillor Starmer asking. Ah, oh, so that is noted. I think all other members we are expecting to arrive perhaps just a little late. Yeah. So if we went through, I could be a whole lot done before they get here. No, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so for items for adoption on block, um, obviously items eight and nine will are workshops, so they will have to be pulled out. Item ten, um, Councillor Martin is pulling out. Item 11, no, item 12, um, thank you Councillor Kerman. Item 13, Councillor Corbell. Um, item 14. Yes, I'll move to you. Okay, Lord Mayor. Not very much like here. Okay. Item 15, um, which is our um, session information papers to note. The, um, okay. So that one's can go through. Um, which means, can I get a mover, please, for items 11 and 15? Is that it? So just to let um, the members of the um, the public note. Item 11 is feedback to the Local Government Association on the Local Nuisance and Litter Control Bill. And item 15, uh, out of session papers of information to note relating to our sister city relationship with uh, Penang, to the 2015 Christmas in the City evaluation, to an update on our tourism action plan development, 
and a quarterly report from our Adelaide Convention Bureau. So um, those two items, or those many items actually when you think of them, um, can be moved by Councillor Corbell and seconded by, I need a seconder, that's Councillor Vershaw. Can I put those items 11 and 15 please, all those in favour? I declare those items carried. Members, that takes us back to item 8, um, a workshop on council funding initiatives. And we have a facilitator here, um, Sabine York, so Sabine can take her spot. Thank you. Now, members, we've got we've got two um, workshops today and uh, tonight, and and a busy agenda beyond that, and then a meeting over dinner. So, um, I'm going to hold us pretty much to a fairly tight deadline on uh, both our workshops. Um, this one relates to council funding initiatives, and um, I wonder if we could. Um, move. Do you, do you want to speak to us, Ben, or do you want me to move straight to those discussion points and draw them to people's attention? Are you happy for me to do that? So, can I get to that page? Okay. So, members, um, if I can just indicate to you, what we are not seeking to do tonight is to is to get down into the detail of our grants and sponsorships. What we're looking at, and what our administration is asking of us, are some high level. Um, uh, guidance so that they can get down into the detail of our um, sponsorships and grants and come back to us with some recommendations. But in order to do that, they've asked us to turn our minds to these six discussion points that are in the materials that have been circulated to you and they relate to, well, we can, uh, perhaps if I can just get um, um, Ms Jung to take us through them and just explain what she wants of us in relation to each one of them and then perhaps we'll both back through them and, and deal with them one by one. And I'm aiming to have this done in 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, I can say, if there's any, if there's any um, response in relation to particular sponsorships and particular grants, obviously that information, um, Sabine's more than happy to take offline. What she's looking for here is high level guidance. Through the chair. Thank you. Yes, um, as you can see from the handout, the, the council's grants and sponsorship program is very, very complex and varied and hasn't been reviewed for a number of years. And now with a new strategic plan, it's timely that we have a look um, to see whether the high level policy that sits behind them or sometimes doesn't sit behind them um, is a new and consistent view from council. So um, as the chair, I mentioned before, Andrew over there has a um, notice uh, a whiteboard in case we, there are questions, she will take them down. We will get back to you probably with an out of session report. But if we could focus this session on the higher level policy implications, that would be great. Also, we will come back to you with what we interpret you are saying to check again whether that is actually correct. So, the discussion points that we want to look at in the first instance is a, is a easy one, it's about are there any gaps or are there any overlaps. Um, the other big um, discussion point is about fund, multi-year funding options. Some programs have them, some don't. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we continue or not? And likewise with CPI increases. Um, we, don't, we currently don't allow for um, CPI increases which is um, not very beneficial to some recipients because those on many year fundings clearly need to spend more money. Whereas at the same time, it's not so good for council because it increases the amount of money that's ring fenced around a particular program. There's also has been some discussion about when is a national or cultural day um, supported and when not, and why are some supported and why aren't? It could be a consistent policy position around that as well as conversation that we've picked up on about how do we know that we get uh, the return on our investment and how can we better um, go about our business to realize benefits. So that's, that's the broad thinking that we've picked up on over the last couple of months and would be really keen to hear your views on. So, 
Um, Councillor Martin, you've got some comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And given that we've got so little time, I'm going to read from my notes. Um, look, there are some broad principles uh, that I would like to throw into the mix. Um, uh, the first relates to um, uh, three-year funding agreements. And I think that the, uh, the principle needs to be established in all of those organisations um, whose uh, uh, support um, uh, we've offered, to, uh, to whom we've offered support for many years, and I'm talking about things like the, the, the festival, the fringe, um, and indeed other organisations, business organisations like uh, Convention Centre, Renew Adelaide. Um, uh, and I think it's a bit of a no-brainer in the sense that by providing that fixed agreement, um, we not only overcome this uh, constant debate and argument about who should get what when, um, we would, if we reach agreement on it at this time, uh, come to a life of council agreement, and uh, um, we would save enormous time and energy on the part of all of the organisations involved, as well as our own staff. But more than that, we give to the organisation certainly, and that enables them in some cases to make decisions about whether they retain staff or whether they, they lose them during the period when there isn't the funding available to them. And I think that's really important. Uh, I particularly uh, single out, and I don't wish to get into the detail, but the organisations in the Adelaide Festivals Group, those are well-established organisations, each deserving of our, uh, our attention. Um, and uh, should be included. Now, I think CPI is also a no-brainer. Uh, it, it's a bit of a backhander to say we're going to support you, but it's going to mean less and less every year. So CPI in terms of grants and sponsorships is, in my view, a reasonable course. I further say, and somewhat controversially, um, I'm certain of that, um, we have held them all down for so long with no increase that an appreciable increase to all of the organisations we ultimately choose to support is for me uh, an important part of this budget process. And I'm not talking about 2% um, or 3%, I think we should be quite brave about it, and lift it in the order of something like 10% so that it sends a clear message. I also think that we need to uh, tighten the criteria for some, uh, some areas. I, I think in recreation and sports, I, I look at what we do and I think, well, really, is that a really um, valid use of our money, giving the uh, old boys of St. Ignatius money for a capital program, uh, giving money to the, um, the wilderness school who don't even reside in the city of Adelaide um, and who've all got more money than we have. Um, additionally, um, I think I want to float the idea, which has come up before in a committee meeting with the Lord Mayor, of some substantial gesture, uh, and it is a gap, in our arts and cultural grants program um, to um, uh, uh, the creation of a goal of a major artwork, an acquisition of a major artwork or public sculpture, preferably, but I'll leave that to discussion, in, in for the city of Adelaide, every term of council. And that necessarily means putting aside big dollars um, over a period of time, if that's the choice of council, but certainly within um, uh, the term of this council. Uh, and in this way, uh, we can acquire major artworks like capital cities like Melbourne. Now, finally, um, there is a very serious discussion to be had about funding cultural diversity, and Sabine touched on it there. And I'm not talking about, and I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about funding uh, for any Indigenous issue. I'm specifically talking about funding for events like Glenby or Carnivali or Schutzenfest, which are regarded as culturally um, diverse groups being supported by council. And um, I say this as a supporter of cultural diversity and someone who worked in the field at SBS for many years. Much as we value the Greek, Italian, German and other mainstream groups within our community, within our culturally diverse community, they are mainstream. They are no longer in the category of new culturally diverse groups in our society. Uh, we are, as a city, we've made a decision to be a refugee welcome zone. Uh, and 
That is specifically about providing uh, support to people from countries like um, uh, the Middle East, Syria, I'm thinking of in particular, Afghanistan, um, Somalia. Now, in my view, that is where we ought to be paying attention. Uh, we, we want to engage in activities that help in the process of building social cohesion. Uh, we've already done that mightily within those established mainstream communities, but those smaller communities who are recent arrivals in this country seem to slip through the net. Uh, and indeed, um, it was brought into sharp focus for me by a taxi driver uh, recently saying to me that he was from Afghanistan and he was a documentary producer in that country and wanted to stage for the community a documentary festival but didn't know how to, how to go about it. Now that's exactly where we should be um, not at the Schutzenfest. Um, so I'd like I'd like oh, our administration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Councillor Martin. Oh, I'm, just I'm sorry, <laughs> Brian, I'm sorry. <laughs> Councillor Martin, thank, thank you very much for those very considered yeah. views, which I think are going to really add to add to it. Okay. We've got some other speakers who are keen. Yep. So um, can I hand over to Councillor Wilkinson and then Councillor uh, Sorry, yeah, Wilkinson and then Councillor Milani. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, on the on the matter of. Um, on the matter of CPI, um, uh, I'm aware that you know virtually all of these programs have been static in dollar terms, whilst we have had CPI increases in rate revenue and, and as well as growth. Through, through new development and stuff like that. So, you know, it's 5.07 million out of a $185 million budget that we have, all granted we pay our staff and, and major overheads out of that. But it, it only represents 2.8% of our current $185 million. But I would suspect that that $5 million was $5 million a decade ago. And uh, I'm not sure if anyone has the answer to that information at the moment, but I'd say in real terms, our entire contribution to all of these things, and obviously the Heritage Incentive Scheme is one I used to bang on about how we've been going backwards in real terms because we've been kept at the same dollar amount every year whilst the cost of construction has been going up beyond the CPI. Um, but that applies to all of these things. So um, I think we should look at what that, fi that five figure was a decade ago and look at what that would be worth if you applied CPI to that figure because I think. It, it other means we're spending more on other other costs of council and we're actually defunding all of these programs. And there's some programs here which you know, like the undergrounding scheme in the main street, but no funds allocated to them at all. And then I'd say part of the problem is the fact that in real terms the total pie here is, is not growing with our revenue. Thanks, Councillor Wilkinson. Um Councillor Milani. Thank you, Chair. Just briefly, um I'm glad to see we're having the discussion around CPI and the cost of doing business because that is exactly why we also need to factor that in for our revenue. Uh, their cost of their cost of doing business is increasing and so is ours. So you've got to put up CPI in terms of expenditure. You've got to consider it in terms Chair, of. Chair. I think you might be jumping ahead Chair. in the agenda there. I'm agreeing that I'm agreeing that CPI. Is uh, the cost of doing business sure, has to be um, has to be incorporated into the criteria? I, I agree. Um, so that's a fair valid point. I think I'm agreeing with both the previous speakers. Um, I also think that certainty is important for in terms of the three-year funding, but I think it particularly applies to our strategic partnerships versus grants, and I think that's something that we need to get the balance of. Um, they have different roles in, in delivering outcomes for us. Um, I agree with Councillor Martin's point about recreation and sport. I think it's equally as important as art, but we do need to look at the criteria. Um, spending rec and sport money on fixing a gate on, on a tennis court is, is not good value to me, and I think we really need to look at the criteria um, around that. Um, and with the multicultural programs, I think we very much need to be mindful of that a lot of them are volunteers, and when they're volunteer organisations, uh, it doesn't matter where, which uh, origin they're from, 
or which diaspora we're talking about, we need to be mindful that they're volunteers. They're volunteers. So I think um, our criteria needs to look at those those um, multicultural groups as, as to how they actually operate and um, factor in most of the time that they are volunteer groups versus some that might be more structurally sound um, and funded from other areas. Uh, so they're my comments. Thank you, Councillor Mali. Councillor Vershaw, then Councillor Abiad, then Lord um, thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, support uh, Phil's consideration of increases and also to look at three year funding agreements. Um, one of the things I think we need to look at is how the um, how it plays out calendar wise in terms of what we're trying to deliver against the strategic plan. Um, so, for instance, there may be some festivals that are within the um, the sponsorships already that with some um, greater increases in monies can be much more significant in terms of delivery back to um, Adelaide, such as the Cabaret Festival or Sala, both of which um, have the potential to again be very groundbreaking in terms of what happens in the rest of the, um, the country. Um, I'd also um, like to think in term, look at in terms of where there might be gaps that we have another look at where we are putting incentives in terms of sustainability and green outcomes. Um, there are a few there, but there aren't many. And I think that if that's really one of the key platforms that is actually, we're going to try and lead the charge, that that should be reflected also in this. Thank you, Councillor <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Just the one thing I want to add in relation to this as well, I think strategically we need to also try to have some policies in place to what is considered to be seed funding to some organisations that we are assisting to, um, to get up on their feet and to, st to start moving. Um, and I know that there's a few of the organisations uh, that are on this sheet that have required some seed funding to initiate and get started, but then they've been supported by their own financial models and external sponsors. And I think it's important to note that our ratepayers have a vested interest in uh, seeing some of these programs um, uh, get put up and, and have a good one on the board, but it's important as well that we encourage entrepreneurship, I guess, in the sense where they're starting to, to work out their own business models, Chair, and uh, they're capable of standing on their own two feet so that we can try to not increase funding and withdraw funding in some instances, uh, and then forward that funding to new groups that are commencing uh, new projects and new ideas. Uh, because we do have a limited resource, I have no problems increasing the whole budget by CBI, but I am a big believer of redirecting funds to uh, new organisations that are required to get up and running, especially from organisations that are more than capable now of running their own race and doing what they need to do. So I think it's if we can sort of consider that as being part of our strategy, I think that's also be uh, very important. So I've still got the Lord Mayor, Councillor Corbell and Councillor Moran, and then I think we'll call it quits then, if, um, unless anybody's got a pressing need, we can um, have ongoing discussions, um, I'm sure. Um, well, Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I'm in favour of looking at CPI in terms of uh, applying a, a CPI lens over many of these events, if not all of them. I think it's probably fairly important. I'm certainly in favour of looking at a greater number of events and giving them surety for uh, a three-year term. I think it's important. I'd like to see also in our next discussion on these events, uh, various programs, is some um, just some very light mapping work in terms of how it fits strategically. I think um, Councillor Aviard touched upon this in terms of how it fits strategically with our emerging strategic plan. I think it's very, very important. So we've got our ship sailing in the right direction. And I'd also like to see, and I do understand that this won't apply to all of the programs within what we're discussing, but to see a greater relevance in terms of how it ties back to tourism. Um, I think that one of our greatest opportunity in terms of many of the events that we sponsor is how does that relate to tourism, or more particularly tourism growth, because we have such a profound economic boost for the state in so many ways for our small businesses, for our everything, um, and not which is in addition to the arts events themselves and the events that we're sponsoring themselves. So I guess. Tourism and how it aligns also with our strategic plan. Councillor Cobell? Yes, to multi year funding options. I think that's really important, especially for our strategic partnerships. 
um, anything around city livability, improving transport, um, carbon neutral Adelaide, and priority on high return on investment um, and alignment with our strategic priorities. I think that's really important. For example, Renew Adelaide, we know that their return on investment is really significant for the city. Um, another one, the sustainable incentive, the 2015-16 increase um, as a result of a co-funding with state government grant where they matched us if we could chase opportunities like that and um, seek them. I think that's really important. We're looking to see that continue and to remain at that higher level. Um, I think it's really important to provide CPI increases. Um, I think that provides a lot of assurance and um, is definitely necessary. And importantly, around the cultural events, I think the transparency is, is really important. Um, it's really important for fairness and consistency and also to support emerging cult, um, cultural events. And Councillor Moran. Yes. Look, I think all this um, chat about CPR or no CPI, um, fixing the rate of dom, not fixing the rate of dom, you're really not talking about a hell of a lot of money there. All these added together, if you increase them by CPI, would be far more than our rate a rate take there. I mean, I, I think because of the amount, small amount of money that it's ridiculous to raise the rates if the CPI is only 1%, which means a, a very flat economy. Um, doing business in the city hasn't, uh, according to the Lord Mayor, gone up really the cost of because um, I think you did tell us that rents are dropping in the city. So, you know, they're not going up that much, the cost of doing business. I'm not for, sorry Phil, um, handing any more money out. Um, I personally wouldn't give the Festival of Arts any money. I think the state it obviously needs support, but I really don't think the council is the area that should do it. I think we step up, and I know it sounds me, I love the Festival of Arts and the French everything, but we tend to step up when the government doesn't. And the more we step up, the more the government backs off. They. It's not an equal partnership. Doesn't bills pay sort of double what we pay? Where they have a billion dollar budget, we have a hundred billion dollar budget. It's it's just not fair. Um, I don't want our ratepayers to have to support these huge events any more than they're already supporting it now. And if by CP increases we're giving a little less each year, well, so be it. I agree with Assam. I would like to see more seed funding to set things up, to send them on their way, and when they're earning money. I think it's it's puzzling that we still give clips of money. I mean, that must be the biggest earning um, event in the, of the year, and yet we still hand them ratepayers' money. Uh, the rationale is that we can put ads for Adelaide all over the thing, or, or they're in Adelaide. I guess they know where they are. Um, so I think we should be more austere with this, and it sounds lovely, you know, whole of council term funding so they can employ people. Is it our core business to do that? It is, yes, but there's more pressing needs for the dollar at the moment. And I think like everything else, the, cut, the cost should be cut to fit the, whatever the expression is. So I won't be supporting any increases at all, just to be the witch from hell. When, you know, it's, it's easy just to say, I want transport, I want babies, I want puppies, I want this, I want that. Um, this is not realistic, something has to give. and. You know, when people are suffering financial hardship and businesses are closing down, these things really help at the edges. They're great, but they're, I think the council has got to focus on core issues. Okay, um, that well done, councillors. Two minutes over, and we've got some, I think, some really valuable feedback. Um, sorry, Sven. Thank you, Chair. Um, and if you could just pull up that next slide. So I would like to reiterate a couple of things. One is um, that we are inviting comments. Please send me an email or I'm very happy to make a meeting time with you to have your views in more detail. Um, we also have a council report going up. No, it's not a report. It's a workshop on financial matters, in particular um, the, the budget matters. And one of the upcoming meetings on, on the 10th of March focus on funding matters, so that's an opportunity for you to provide more details there. We will aim to get back to you on the policy matters on the 8th of March. So thank you very much. It's been really useful. Thank you, Sven. Which brings us to item uh, 9 on our agenda. Um, uh, again, a workshop, events in the park plans policy review. And members will note that we've also got a confidential report attached to the back of our agenda. And um, I'm going to call on... 
I'm going to call on um, Ms. Mockler in a minute to introduce our, our um, uh, introduce this workshop. But can I just ask you, there, there'll be an opportunity for questions, can I just be, ask you to be mindful of the fact that some of this material is held in a, in a confidential report? And uh, that's because people have shared uh, financial data with us and it's really important that we maintain the confidentiality in relation to that. So I'm going to hand over to um, Ms. Mockler who will uh, introduce this workshop and take you through it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Rob Williamson, who's our Director at Savills. Uh, many of you will know and have worked with Rob over the last 20 years. Um, he most recently undertook the review of the leasing arrangements for buildings in the parkland. Uh, Rob's engaged to review our approach to fees for events in the parkland, firstly to undertake a comparative market, market analysis, as well as uh, provide us some advice on how to achieve commercial comparability. Um, this piece, is, uh, piece of work is a key part of the project endorsed by Council uh, back in October uh, last year, um, and that's a broader review of the events in the Parklands policy. So tonight we'd like to get Council's feedback on the findings from the review, um, as well as gain your thoughts on what we should consider as part of the fees bill uh, for the 16-17 budget. So I'll hand over to Rob, he'll give you a brief overview of his findings and then it'll be open to members for uh, feedback. Rob? Welcome Rob, there's a speak button in front of you, you can press the button, the red light will come on and away you go. Thank you very much and thank you very much for having me here tonight to speak a few words and hopefully elaborate if you need some elaboration. Uh, I thought rather than sort of uh, go into too much detail with this report, uh, I'll just start by saying it's not a perfect report. This is a very difficult report to try and put together because you're seeking uh, a lot of financial information from dis different sources. And I, I guess I've used my uh, time in the marketplace uh, and skills, I guess, in, in some way to try and gather as much accurate information as possible to try and put some accurate numbers together or numbers that we can sort of rely upon to help put this report together. Um, what I was keen to do initially was to produce some modelling based upon a number of the events in the parklands, trying to get underneath the surface and find out exactly uh, uh, how they derive their income, what their cost structures are, uh, how they operate and uh, and really get in tune with what they're doing uh, and then following that have interviews with the stakeholders and sort of run these figures past their noses and try and get some positive feedback and I guess some notes of accuracy in, in that uh, and then to look at the interstate situations look at how we compare with interstate and I should congratulate you and the executive on um, really uh, being a, a shining light compared to other states, I have to say. That was, um, in my view, a little shabby in other states compared to the way we run things in South Australia, so that was a very good thing. Uh, I looked at um, uh, then some comparative rent modelling exercises because one of the points of this exercise was to consider, is there a better way of charging fees for events in the parklands? At the moment, they are on a volumetric basis, uh, according to how many people attend events. Uh, and uh, essentially, that's worked very well so far. But is it better to transition to a rate per square metre, or a site, or a stall rate, or some other sort of system? And if you remember, we have successfully um, done that with the, uh, the buildings and the parklands, and that's been a very successful exercise, I understand. And so we're looking at whether there's a comparative way of doing it for events in the parklands. And, and I did come up with a structure, you can see it for yourself, it's not a perfect structure. It probably still needs some work if it was to go that way. Uh, it's possible, but by and large, my findings are probably you're better off sticking with the system you've got uh, and, and embark upon a few sensible improvements, uh, namely um, to probably consider terms and by considering terms for some of those uh, events in the parklands uh, it will probably will likely in my view uh, encourage more activation in some of the areas of your packs like sea activated um, and uh, and uh, and maybe sort of have some more uh, market-led uh, 
annual increases to the current system operates. So I hope that gives you a brief summary as, as to how I approach the task and happy to take your questions. Thank you, Rob. We've got some questions or some comments from members. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, thank you. I uh, read the documents and I think it's a sensational job which provides the intellectual basis for us to proceed um, and providing the tiered arrangement for um, uh, hire is a, an excellent idea. And just one quick question. You identified potential spaces um, and all of them seem to be areas where we already have leases with other parties. So would that necessitate changing the head lease, our lease with the organisations or approaching them um, as potential venues uh, acting as a young man? Oh, no, I think you can operate the way you're operating now. But I think, I think the issue here is that you have an opportunity here to probably see some growth, um, and I and I, I think it's there's there's uh, there are operators who are here year on year, and uh, I mean we can look at the current fringe. It's been a, a growth year on year. I mean it's the envy. It's the second best in the globe. Can't, don't get much better than that. Um, and uh, uh, but because the the um, negotiations occur annually. If uh, a term was in place, it is likely, I think, that there are other contributors who might be interested in, in sort of joining the party, so to speak, who might sort of say, OK, they're locked away for a period of time. What other space can we really you know, invigorate or, or do something on? So there might be some growth that comes out of that process. OK, thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Martin? Yep, yep. Sort of. yep that's um, good. Um, Councillor Abbey and then the Lord Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. Look, um, in supporting this document uh, initially and sending it out to market, uh, for me, it was about trying to simplify the process to um, a lot of the applicants or new applicants or newcomers to the market to understand what they can and can't do uh, around some of the spaces we have in the square, uh, some of the spaces we have in the, in the city. Um, so look, I think to some degree, this, um, this document does assist in that process. But the other reason for me was also to bring about a bit of fairness in process around some of the new entrants to the market around rates. To some degree, if we're operating a big shopping centre and there's a different retail mix, obviously, that we want to try to bring about in the city, um, some of the spaces obviously would depend on the amount of revenue some of the businesses would generate uh, versus some of the other businesses that are designed to attract people but not generate enough revenue. What I don't think this document does, um, and I don't, this is, might be a very challenging thing to try to achieve, but in essence, if we're looking at, a, a, at the 5 to 12 percent revenue of occupancy for any specific business in the city of Adelaide, to, to try to assist some of those businesses in uh, providing a plan, uh, I guess, a, a fair playing field between the business and some of the applications in the park was uh, to put about, um, I guess, a charge uh, that, um, I guess, that will assist for everyone to compete on the same playing field because we're, we're introducing uh, spaces within the city of Adelaide uh, at a very discounted rate in comparison to some of the businesses and this is where the debate has taken shape and this was part of the process in building this report. But, uh, you know, something like, uh, is there, and I think this is the question here, is there an opportunity uh, to charge based on revenue turnover for some of the events uh, versus um, an event that generates no revenue that's designed for cultural or community activation? And how would we achieve that if that's the path the council just took? Yeah, look, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's pro and it's probably a question that many have around this chamber, I should, I, I'd imagine. It's a question that I had to uh, deal with uh, in dealing with a, uh, a number of state government departments who have income earning areas in their uh, national parks and so forth some years ago. And what they did was they put a system in place like that. And uh, when it failed and failed miserably, they employed me to unpackage it, put something together that, that, that would work. And the difficulty is, is, is the difficulties in collection, mm. collection of the data, it's the difficulty then is in getting somebody to assess the data uh, conscientiously and, and in confidence over a period of time. And the other issue is um, um, you'll find a lot of good quality entrepreneurs will just go somewhere else if they're subject to those types of systems in terms of rental 
it just doesn't seem to operate very well in this arena of of largely food and beverage and events and you know uh, a mixture of non-for-profit organisations and all sorts of different uh, bodies like that. So I think the, the, no, the notion of it is actually very good and very sound, but I think the practicality of it, uh, I would caution you on. You, you're welcome to do it, but I, I, I would suspect that it would end in tears, the same as it has with state government. Because, just to follow up, that's okay, through you, Chair. Um, some of the things that you noted here around, you know, free entry events versus cost ticketed yes. event, um, non-for-profit um, events versus commercial events, et cetera. Uh, are we then to, I guess, trigger a premium when it becomes a ticketed event or a commercial event? And that's how we, I guess, justify um, some of the increase in cost versus to a non-profit event or a community-based event. Is, is that how you see it? I think that's a better way of going to, to look at perhaps some strata issues, but uh, it's the difficulty is too that um, with a number of events you've got a, an eclectic mix of groups together and what I discovered when I interviewed, you know, for example, some of the non-profits or, or other types of organisations, they were very afraid that if they lost the commercial people that worked alongside of them that it would negatively impact on what they were doing and their growth cycle. So it's 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 it's, it's a, a maze, Council, I have to say. Because there's an issue of equity as well in some of the figures. I mean, you know, someone that's, um, you know, taking on two days spending 50000 someone that's taking on 24 days spending 50000 uh, and there's an issue of equity around, you know, event organisers that are looking at this going, well, you know, you're charging me for two days $50,000 and someone else is taking on an event for 24 days, they're getting $58,000. Mm -hmm. You know, how does that, how do we reconcile that? Well, the volumetric exercise sort of deals with that to a certain degree. Uh, and um, uh, the other issue is, uh, as you can see with a comparison with interstate, and a couple of those charts there, uh, the longer you go, uh, the cheaper it gets, generally across the country. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, is that generally, uh, the population is compressed into some of this, the, the the events that are over a, uh, a shorter period uh, and expanded over the longer period, and but your cost structures are there, and, and they're the other things that, that really eat into the, the whole exercise. Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor, then Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Ante, Councillor Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I, it's a good piece of work, and I, this classification of um, <coughs> sites into <coughs> three principal categories based upon their popularity, I think has a great deal of merit. Um, the, was, was seasonality taken into account also in any of the work that you did? Um, that of course, when we have a peak demand period and we're in it now, but did seasonality factor on? No. Okay. Sorry, can I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> That's something that should be looked into. Yes, I mean, we tended to focus on the events that exist Yep. and the times that they existed rather than look too much at. Uh... I just wonder, uh, and there is, you know, this is a very good basis on, to inform future discussion. So it's a great starting point, so thank you. But um, this three-tier classification, if for us to, we know that, we know that, you know, our city is changing. We know that uh, the, the West End of the city is probably a very good example by way of illustration, is becoming a greater worker, Density, greater residential density, etc., etc., etc. You know, we need to be having robust discussions around our West Park lands, uh, certainly with regards to this matter. But we maybe we would need to consider some uh, fairly um, pronounced incentives if we're looking at uh, around uh, which areas in the city we're looking to incentivise people to use. And there were some suggestions here on what they could be. I don't think they're possibly strong enough. But also around seasonality. Um, uh, is that there are other times of the year we've got very comparatively little going on. And, uh, you know, that's principally due to weather, I get that. But if we could be exploring seasonality also, as well as, um, uh, you know, the three P's I've written here, premium, popular and potential spaces, um, maybe that would add to the mix. Councillor Wilkinson, who is next, has just popped out, so I'm going to jump to you, Councillor Hunt. Thank you, Chair. I think actually Councillor Abbey had might have asked in a roundabout sort of way the question I was going to ask, which was simply the, the issue of revenue raised is obviously going to be a pretty relevant one. 
I mean, can, can that be said with any degree of confidence? Um, I mean, you know, I, mean, I guess the figures that have come to are, they're based on assumptions, so they have to be, but they're based on information that's been provided, however it may be. It may well be that that figure is significantly under. Oh, look, Councillor, I, I, would, I would treat the, uh, the uh, figures I've supplied as uh, likely to be conservative. Mm. But I think what you need to understand is the risk reward <coughs> is the real issue here. Uh, and uh, one particular organisation who's represented there uh, had a nasty experience recently due to weather. And so the risk reward, it's a bit like farming, you know, I mean, you can have five good years and then you can have a bad year that sort of wipes out three good years, you know. So it's a, there is a bit of a risk reward issue here where people are taking on an enormous amount of risk because they're having to book way ahead and lock in, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, if you look at the, even on those conservative numbers, those, uh, um, the returns are not massive. I would imagine they might be higher than that, but they're not massive. You know, they're quite comparative to other organisations and given the risk reward, um, yes, I wouldn't like us, I wouldn't like the council to be taking over that role, taking on, doing some of these events. Thank you. Councillor Virchel. Um, thank you. I, I was just wondering how you factored it. The risk reward was, was one that I was going to talk to because I know that a lot of the um, events that take at the parklands, particularly this time of year, have uh, not always done as well as they may be doing now and have taken many risks, particularly with um, heat waves, flood events, you know. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering how you factored in sort of one, the bump in, bump out, because those big events might be there for 24 days, but they've got their um, schedules in terms of getting in and out of the site and also remediation because obviously in the premium sites the remediation costs will be uh, possibly higher. Yeah, well those are need to get the, the grounds back. The remediation site costs were considered in this report yeah. um, and uh, you know uh, they weren't too bad and by and large uh, um, participants were, were reasonably happy with that process. I think uh, you know, the, the cost and how that sort of measured out to them. I don't think there was too many complaints from anybody. And do you think that giving uh, longer term leases, particularly the events that come back every year, would help with that cycle of remediation and investment? I don't think it'll change that. I think the remediation cost will be the remediation cost, yeah. whatever it will, will be. The benefit of, uh, of locking in terms or giving terms is solely for planning reasons and to remove the strata of uh, almost a wasted process annually, mm -hmm. where it could be going into planning the next event and getting on with things. Uh, I, and I also preface that by saying what I said before, and that is that I think if you're locking in some terms, it's highly likely that it will cause activation of other sites. <coughs> Councillors, we're getting very close to um, the next uh, committee meeting. So I've still got Councillor Wilkinson who's got a question and I think I'll make that our last question for you. Um, if you could just bear with us, we have to go through this rather odd process Certainly. where I seek to adjourn, I seek to ask, ask someone to move for an adjournment of this meeting, uh, moved by Councillor Cohen, seconded by Councillor Vershaw. Can I put that, that's passed. So I declare this meeting adjourned and hand over to Councillor Nadia. I declare the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting on Tuesday the 16th of February 2016 open at 6.22pm and I seek someone to adjourn this meeting. Councillor Kerrahan, seconded by Councillor Antic. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Meetings adjourned. Which allows me to reopen my meeting and to, um, and to move to no, Councillor Wilkinson for a question. Thank you. Um, in terms of the data that you got in this, you said that you had interviewed participants such as the operators of the Garden and the Delights, the operators of the Royal Croquet Club. Um, what check have you got that the information that you have got from, provided from them to you that provided this confidential code to is, is valid and that they haven't uh, understated what their bar takings are, for example. Councillor Wilkinson, that question was sort of asked in your absence, but if you just um, might, might like to respond again. Yes, uh, Councillor Wilkinson, it's not a perfect report. Uh, 
I've done my best to collect as much data as possible and create it as accurate as po possible and run it past an, uh, quite a number of source points um, uh, across a great sphere. And I'm happy to, to talk about those at a later time. Uh, uh, I, I think the figures are likely to be conservative. Um, uh, their accuracy is, um, I think, reasonable at best. Um, because, um, you know, speaking with people generally in the industry, they have an expectation of $2,000 of sales per shift per bar staff. So if you've got 85 bar staff on over a five week period, you're, you're going to end up more like 5.1 million, not 1.1 million. So, so just if you just by looking at the number of bar staff, and we had a public meeting when when that number of um, of bar staff was was um, was um, was said at a public meeting by by the operator of Royal Croak Hay Club. So that's where that information came from. So um, you know you could look at the industry and, and how they work, the sort of the profits that they make from the amount of staff. So you can't count every drink, but you can work out. No one's going to put on more staff. Than is feasible. So, so you know, Councillor Wilkinson, I take that as a question, and just uh, so really, what Councillor Wilkinson I think is asking is, have you looked at some of those industry norms in, in and uh, aligned them against your figures? I looked at a number of different source points to check the information that was presented here. I mean, there is a great deal of hearsay in regards to trading information uh, at all sorts of events, and I've, I've done my best to to get sort of accurate information as best I can. Mm. So members, um, uh, we've got a big agenda and um, um, unless anybody's got, no, I'm not even going to say that. I'm going to say, uh, say thank you very much to, um, to Rob for coming and giving his presentation. We do still have a confidential agenda item at the end of our agenda, as you know, and uh, Rob will be here for that as well, so there is an opportunity for some further discussion if needs be. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much for your presentation, for the work you've done, and um, and for the good news really you've brought us that we're really um, we've aligned us reasonably well as things currently stand. We're doing pretty well by comparison to other states, which is good to hear. Thank you very much. Um, so. Um, that brings us to uh, item 10, which has been called out by Councillor Martin. Uh, the automatic external defibrillators, defri that's quite hard word to say, the defibrillators in the city. <laughs> Councillor Martin, over to you. Um, thank you, Chair. Look, I, I did the email everybody this afternoon to say that I was proposing an amendment, so I'm wondering if someone moved the substantive. Would you want to move it as the... I can just move it as an amendment. Okay. You can move it as the motion rather than move the motion as printed. You can move your. It's not a motion on notice. I mean, it's just a motion. Okay. All right. What I'm proposing then is that the recommendation stands except for one, which now reads partners as proposed in option A with the SA Ambulance Service and other key stakeholders to trial the availability and use of public access to fibrillators for 12 months in key locations throughout the city and North Adelaide and proceed to purchase and install defibrillators for council buildings in the locations and in the manner outlined in option B. So we've got um, that up on the screen, Councillor Martin. We need a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, look, this, um, I, I did hear some muttering that this is a uh, budget bid. Uh, it does require funding, but it's not a, uh, a budget bid as such. It is a, an initiative that I thought everybody supported. In fact, the last time I spoke about this, I was told to sit down and stop talking because everybody supported it. Um, the material before you um, shows that the administration is proposing uh, a trial of working with other organisations, including the SA Ambulance Service, to place one or more defibrillators in the public realm uh, and to establish a, a published network of uh, automated external defibrillators so people know where to find them, along with supporting training and a media awareness campaign. Um, it's a good idea and I'd be very pleased if everybody supported that as they can in this motion. Um, it'll be a step on the road uh, to reducing the number of fatalities that arise from sudden cardiac arrest. I don't need to tell you about how important these devices are in that process. 
But uh, adopting just option A is not, in my view, all that we can do. We can also choose option B, um, which for an indicative budget of $17,000 will deliver defibrillators to seven city council locations where there are none at this time. And that would be the City Library, Hutt Street Library, the three community centres, including North Adelaide, the Adelaide Bus Station, and importantly, the Rundle Mall Visitor Centre would all get one. Now, um, of course, I would expect in proposing this that the administration will need to undertake a, a risk assessment to uh, judge the best way forward in terms of working uh, uh, with our staff to find out whether, in fact, it's possible for our staff uh, to be involved in this process um, or whether uh, they need some training, whether it might be some or it might be all. Um, I understand duty statements don't include at this time administering uh, electric shocks to people who've suffered some cardiac arrest or indeed to administer first aid, as I understand it. So uh, that would need to be a part of this process. And I make that very clear to the administration. Um, we would need uh, to see how that would work with staff. But um, uh, this is a, a big step. Um, it will be uh, an important step in not only putting uh, uh, defibrillators in the, the public realm so that we can see whether that works, but also in completing uh, the matrix of automated external defibrillators in all of our buildings in much the same way that happens in other city councils. And I am aware, as everybody else is uh, from the documents we've been supplied, that other cities do this. They ensure that the defibrillators are available and uh, that they're there to save lives. Now, um, that, by the way, uh, um, is for uh, uh, the benefit of not only people who are passing by and using facilities, but also for the benefit of a considerable number of staff. Um, the, uh, the expenditure in this, that is option A and option B together, uh, represent an indicative budget of $20,000. And uh, fr frankly, uh, Chair, $20,000 is very little money if we are talking about the possibility of saving just one life in the, uh, the CBD over the coming year or next five years or the life of defibrillators. So uh, on that basis, I'd, uh, I'd ask everyone to support this. Councillor Wilkins, a new second. Would you like to speak? Uh, yeah, just having had a friend who wouldn't be alive today if it were not for a defibrillator, I couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, urge members more to, to support this very important uh, thing, which is a no-brain really. Good Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I want to support this, but I just would like some clarity with regards to some questions. Uh, this motion recommends that uh, these units be, be put in our own council buildings and <coughs> Councillor Martin touched upon it himself in his preamble, but the, uh, through the CEO, can our staff use these machines? What, what in fact would be required? Is there any... Um, what is the process here? I'd just like that clarity before I make a decision. Um, through the chair, we the reason why we went for option A is that with option B, you're right, the staff implications do need to be assessed. Um, you'll see in paragraph 24.1, um, it's um, important that you know if someone uh, feels that uh, a need to be able to use this, that they're properly trained and it becomes part of the role that we do our due diligence with our people and culture team to make sure that um, if we do go down this route that we do it with um, with the uh, staff um, support. So we would need to assess that and if there were any challenges around that, we would bring that back. Any further questions for me? No, thanks, Jim. Councillor Milani. Just got a quick question. Um, can, uh, can someone please tell me, um, Chair, CEO, we had a meeting with the Heart Foundation who are working on currently mapping all of the different <coughs> letters, um around the city. Is this the same project with um, SA Ambulance or is that a separate, um, this, this, this availability and use of public access to fibrillators, is that the same project or is it a different project? Does anyone know? 
Oh, uh, look, I'm happy to answer that. No, I'm asking the... Sure. Through the chair. Um, it's a separate project. There are several projects on the go at the moment and the South Australian Ambulance Service is seeking to work with a number of emergency response agencies to coordinate what has not been a very coordinated response in the past. So I guess the um, option A that was proposed here gives St John Ambulance a chance to actually engage with those other agencies and establish some systems and processes that just have not been in place previously. So sorry, just to clarify, so that so the so there's you said there's a couple of projects that are going on and mapping these things. So I know the Heart Foundation are talking to you know um, Google Maps where you you know it comes up when you 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 find etc when you're walking through. So you're so. So they're all different, separate, in, independent projects. The South Australian Ambulance Service is seeking to bring some of those together um, so that there is a coordinated effort. So at the moment, yes, they are quite separate projects, but one of the benefits of option A is that St John and um, the South Australian Ambulance Service are seeking to bring a lot of that together. Chair, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I support this, but I just want to make an amendment, I think, just to um, just bear with me. Um, to keep um, the, the, I'll just go back, go back to the original one. I'll just I'll come to option B in a minute, and just put SA Ambulance um, and other key stakeholders, including Heart Foundation. It's uh, and uh, sure it's already in there. It's in the main document. It says. Um, and my point too. I can try to make an amendment. Um, and just give yes, a moment. Yes. Let's see what it is. <laughs> I just know that's a significant project that's going on, specifically that they're doing that, and I believe they're doing that with St John's or something. Maybe I get my bodies confused. Um, and two. So well, just two. to get some clarity, are you suggesting that um, paragraph one be as printed? So you're trying to revert to paragraph one? Yep. Point two. So paragraph one as printed with the green. Point paragraph two. Can you go back up? I want a new paragraph too, please. That, um, uh, and, and I do want to include option B, but I want to um, put, put it as part of our budget consideration. So I'm saying that I want us to go ahead and, and it go into, as part of our upcoming budget, we um, identify how we can deliver option B. So we actually put it in the budget and then I'm okay with the rest of it. So just, we just got how, to so how, can we identify how we, how we can fund option B? Because I think option B is important but I just want to know where the money is going to come from. Okay, so we've got some clarity on that. Do I have a second to the and, council? Oh, and sorry, three and four are okay. Is three and four to stay as is? Oh, well, you can, yeah, the rest of it's fine. Well, two, whatever that becomes now. Just three. renumbered. So, members, um, I'll just perhaps get um, again, to scroll down again just so people can see what it is. So, this is uh, Councillor Nalani's amendment. Do I have a second of that amendment? Seconded by Councillor Corbell. I just briefly, I don't want to take away from what Councillor March want to do, but I just I am curious as around budget um, and and how we can actually systematically roll this out um, so, sooner rather than later. Um, and it could it could come from this year's budget, it could come from next year's budget. So um, I just would like to know, to know where that budget's going to come from. But in in essence, I'm very supportive of the outcome here. Councillor Corbell has seconded. Do you wish to speak to the amendment? Um, just that I think it's important we know where the money's come from. Option two is, you know, it's just under forty thousand um, dollars, and that doesn't include any ongoing maintenance or the retraining of staff. If we lose, if we lose staff, I think it's a good value for money investment, and it's providing an important service to the community. But it'd be good to know where it comes from. Um, and I think I agree with the systematic rollout as well. Like if there's um, other private operators and not for profits that are already doing work on mapping defibrillators, we should be tapping into that. Anyone else wish to cast my round? Look, um, it's a very hard one to um, to disagree with, um, but 
I wonder whether it would be more, I mean, I, I presume you'd have to have the heart attack within fairly close distance to the defibrillator. I gather we're out the front is probably one place. We've got one at the marker, but it is up in the stuff. Wouldn't it be better to buy 10 defibrillators and give it to the St John's Ambulance in their new, they have a new high response car that's got exactly. an ambulance, it's a four wheel drive. Um, and they got get they can get around quickly because I've never seen anybody have a heart attack out the front. So uh, look, I, I, as I said, it's a hard one to argue against, but I just think there might be a better way because when you have a heart attack in Hunt Street or something, the defibrillator is going to have to come and come to you, isn't it? I'm not going to be able to drag myself along the footpath to get the defibrillator. So um, I'd like the mover to talk me into why we wouldn't be better just buying defibrillators. That they've already got it. Like I buy. And, I don't know. I do something like that. But I, I'm not not convinced that um, I'm going to have my heart attack by the council. Or I might, but you know. <laughs> 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 right, <'cause laughs> Councillor <laughs> 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 Martin, just to, uh, to speak on the. Um, yes, I'm speaking to the amendment chair. Yeah, um, I hear Councillor Blaney say that she supports this in principle and she doesn't want to get in the way, but frankly, she is getting in the way. It's an incredibly disingenuous proposal to be saying, I want to know where the money's coming from when the same councillor endorsed a motion a few months ago to remove outdoor dining fees for catering businesses in the city, a budget measure that was going to cost half a million dollars without so much as batting an eyelid. And now when we're talking about devices that will save lives and cost $20,000, there's this urgent and pressing need to find where the money's coming from. It's, it's so simple. There is money available this year, but I'm happy for it to come out of next year's budget if she prefers. And indeed, if Councillor Milani has read her papers from the Finance and Business Services Committee, which is occurring shortly, there are hundreds of thousands of dollars that are about to be transferred uh, moved about through our budget process because they're unspent. $20,000 is nothing. Now, the reason we're having this conversation is because of the time it takes for ambulance services to get to the scene of someone who suffers a sudden cardiac arrest. You have five minutes, five minutes in which your chances of surviving then decrease by something like 20% every minute. So by the time an ambulance reaches you, you're in no, you have no capacity to survive. You're gone. The idea of having more of these devices in more locations, and indeed the the conversation that was had about creating the matrix, is that SA Ambulance is able to respond to a call where there is somebody who's collapsed with a suspected sudden cardiac arrest, and to say to the caller. There is a defibrillator within one minute of where you are. There's a defibrillator five minutes away. That is what the network is all about that SA Ambulance is proposing. Now, the Heart Foundation might be a player in all of this, and that's fine. And the original motion uh, uh, urged support of uh, the actions of key stakeholders apart from SA Ambulance. But SA Ambulance has to be the driver of this proposal. Now, uh, I, I don't see uh, any harm in this proposal going forward as I have put it. Whether this, the funding comes from next year, this year, or from uh, my back pocket, I don't really care. It is the principle of this, and that is to provide defibrillators that will save the lives of people passing those locations where we had them located, save the lives of our, of our own 1,100 staff who enter into our buildings every day, and uh, contribute to this matrix that SA Ambulance is building in the city of Adelaide. Um, it seems like a no-brainer to me. I can't understand why we have such uh, long debates about $20,000 and half a million dollars in outdoor dining fees goes like that. Please explain to me. Um, members, can I put the amendment? Ah, oh, beg your pardon. Thank you. We have long debates on briefing memos as well. Um, Look, I, I, want, I want to be very clear that I, I'm very much supportive of this. And I actually, I looked at the words and I'm not fussed whether it's the next year's budget or this year's budget. I just want some clarity and, and if the administration can can take that on notice or if I need to slightly vary that because I um, um, would be happy to if my second is, uh, but... Not in summing up at the moment. 
Okay, well, that can be taken on notice because I just, what I'm mindful of is A, um, and I happen to know I spent a lot of time with the Heart Foundation on their, the significant project that they are undertaking in this space. So I just wanted to really factor it in. They're, they're, they're putting a lot of resource into this very, very type of project. But I also um, don't want us to duplicate resource. So I want us to be very mindful of what's going on. Um, this the, the outdoor dining scenario, we asked for a report. I'm going to ask for, I'm okay to ask for a report to explore these things. This is asking for money. I'm just, I'm just putting it through a filter. Um, and, and I think it's important that, that we do that. So there's small, small amendments I'm making. There's no point talking about the fact that we're not on the same team here. We are all actually, as Councillor Maria said, very supportive of, of the intent of this motion. No one disagrees, but I think we need to just be mindful of our role in this and how we can get best leverage. Before I put it to the vote, I've just had the CEO uh, propose a potential solution to this. Through the Chair, following this committee meeting, we've got the Finance and Business Services Committee who are dealing with QF2. Should Council be of a mind, it may wish to make provision for this expenditure tonight. So, based on that advice, would it be better to leave... Um, can we just leave it at this, or what's the best motion to go through? Put the amendment. Okay, well, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour oh, of the sorry, amendment. Sorry, what does that mean? I'm not sure that means. Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work that out myself. Let's get some and that's what That's what point two of my um, motion was meant to mean. We can look at okay. this year's budget and next year and the pro budget process. Okay, so, so I guess what that means is um, we put the amendment. If the amendment gets up, then we'll be able to have a look at this immediately, that is, uh, in the next committee. No, Chair, right. if the amendment is lost, we can still do the same. Yeah, we can do another. So either either way, it looks like we are uh, likely to be able to resolve this satisfactorily this evening, Correct. one way or another. <laughs> Okay. Well, can I, just, just on that, I mean, <laughs> no, no, we're going to have clarity. We're looking at... Sorry, um, ladies and gentlemen, can we, um, can we put the, a, the amendment, please? All those in favour of the amendment? All those against the amendment? Can we just do that in a second? It doesn't really matter. Okay. So, all those in favour of the amendment? Hands up high so we can see one. Yep. All those against the amendment? <laughs> so the amendment is lost, which takes us back to the original motion. Um, do you wish to speak to it any further? No, Chair, only to say that the issue that was identified about funding we can deal with in the next committee. We won't need to do that now, I don't think. So, um, uh, You've summed up. Sorry, sorry, beg your pardon. Sorry, just a, one thing that I've noticed. In this, sorry, Chair. Did he sum up? Or uh, I think he did. Indeed, he has. Right. Okay. Okay. He does. He does. Right. They want to speak. Your turn. I beg your pardon. You're you're right. I was in an error. No, I summed up. You have summed up. No, but I didn't ask other people whether they wished to speak. So I was in error. I just wonder whether I can just to rewind that. No, no, just a point. Don't one moment. Can I get some advice? Yeah. Okay, so apparently if there's some questions, we can put those questions as my error, I apologise, but bearing in mind, yeah. members, this is going to be resolved in about two minutes, can we not argue to about this for too much longer? Not so if argument. you have a question, apparently you're entitled to put a question, and then we can vote on the original motion. It's a question of clarity. I believe the, uh, the motion that Councillor Martin has moved funds it. It doesn't look at funding options. It just funds it, so it's already funded. That's what I'm trying to ascertain. So that's what I was trying to work out before he sums up his motion, because that's that's the assumption. Is that can I get that, that question answered? That is absolutely my understanding. So it's funded now. Yeah. That's what I want to know. So just okay. Go through it and we'll... okay. All right. Is that is that correct? That says we understand the motion. Yep. Yes, right. to fund it. That's your intent, Councillor Martin. Um, Chair, look, I, I don't care whether it's funded between now and June or after July 1st. Okay. I'd just like the proposal to go through. Okay, so members, can I put the original motion, please, as put by Councillor um, uh, Martin? All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Can we move now to item 12? Councillor Clarahan, um, this you called out this item Ivan City Access Project Transfer of Land to State Government and Project Deed. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question through the chair, and that was in relation to, um, I recall. I'm not sure whether it was in the report or something I read about the Development Assessment Commission um, withholding approval um, because of certain issues. And I just wondered whether administration could comment on that and if it, and if it sort of influences or affects what we're about to vote on here. Particular DAC hasn't approved it, is my understanding. So that's correct through the chair. The development approval was considered by DAC um, last Thursday, and DAC determined to defer their decision for two weeks. So it will be going back to DAC next Thursday, the 25th of February, for their decision. And does it impact in any way on what we're about to determine this evening? So we can separately continue with um, the council resolution as written, um, or we could choose to make some parts of it uh, dependent on the DAC development approval. Yes, and I, well, I would like to see that happen. Uh, however, I think we need some assistance from administration as to the wording of that. And yeah. So I think we've already got some wording for you, Councillor Clarehan. Oh. If we could get that um, potential wording put up on the, the so um, <coughs> just one moment, um, members, just while we include these words subject to DAC approval. So um, if you, as you can see, before you um, move that, I wonder if we could well, just... I haven't moved it, I asked a question. Okay. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, I thought you were indicated that you wanted to move it, but you were seeking some administrative help, and they've already provided the administrative help, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Preemptive administrative help. I can move it. I'm happy to move it. Okay. Moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by... Councillor. Uh, I've got a question. No, okay, well, I need a seconder before we get to... Seconded by the Lord Mayor. Mm -hmm. Councillor Moran. Oh, I, don't, I don't think that's self explanatory. But I think we, I, look, for the change, as Sue's pointed out, I think we should wait to see what DAC's doing and what their problem is. I, I don't really support this project, but um, this is the next step along the way. But uh, it's only two weeks, so I think we can wait to see what's happening. Seconded by um, the Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak to this one? No, I'll reserve my right. Councillor Wilkinson? No, just my planning hat on. Um, development approval is development plan consent, building wells consent, and then development approval. So, should that really be um, uh, development plan consent from DAC? Not development, because development approval, that means that, that this can't happen until full development approval actually happens. So, maybe that wording needs to reflect it's just the that the it's the tick from DAC mm -hmm. is really the, the thing, not not full development approval before any of these other processes. Otherwise, all of these processes are held up right until the full development approval, which will be. Can we just get an answer to that? We, 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 find we get some administrative comment, and then perhaps we can vary the motion. Um, through the chair, introducing Mike Ryan, who I think is probably the member for from Northern Water Coast Lawyers. Um, through the chair, that, well, that is right. Development approval, if you use the capital DA in its formal sense, would of course mean both of those two processes, both the use and obviously the technical build approval as well. Whether you wish to rephrase that to obviously only cover off what is really essentially the use component of it, which I think is what was intended by the proposed amendment to obviously assist with our recommendation. Development consent by DAC. Yeah. Um, I, I think that would achieve the outcome you're looking at. So, so Councillor Moran, as the mover, do you seek um, to vary in those terms? I do. Um, and the second, uh, Lord Mayor, are you happy for that variation? I will. Is that consistent for each of the... Yes, it will be. Yes, I am. Yeah. So I seek the approval of the meeting um, for that variation. Can I have a show of hands? 
So that variation is allowed. Um, so where are we up to? We're up to Councillor Wilkinson. Did you have? A, did you want to speak to this as well as ask a question? No, I just wanted to get that space. Okay. I, I wonder if I could just ask a, a brief question from the chair, and that is, that this subject to the approval has been applied to some of the paragraphs and not to others. And I wonder if you could just quickly speak to why that is the case. So through the chair, um, there's certain processes that are listed within the proposed recommendation that relate directly to uh, the process of us agreeing for that land to be transferred to the minister, the parklands plan being updated, and then the execution of the project deed. There are real key big levers regarding this project where we have the most influence over what happens. The other recommendations are around council noting some of the elements of the deed and also some internal processes to delegate responsibility through to the CEO for finalisation of documents and such like. So that's why that particular phrase applies to three out of those recommendations only. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Martin. Yeah, and look, I want to take up that point exactly, Chair, in respect of point 28, where it's noted that those two items are excluded at this time. And I just wondered, uh, particularly since they're important to the East End, what is the problem with the agreement over the number and width of uh, lanes running east-west on Rundle Road and the configuration of that? Is it that we can't agree or...? Um. So through the chair, um, there's effectively an ongoing debate between the technical teams regarding what's the best arrangement for that particular road, and that's a combination of lanes, lane widths and parking configuration. Now, of course, depending on how you lay out the parking gives you a difference in the number of parking spaces that you can achieve. And then the angle of parking has an implication of the, the lane widths that you need and the number of lanes that you can achieve. And then the other factor that we're trying to accommodate within that row, so we've got lots of conflicting priorities, is then uh, the impact back to the ring route and the possible tailback of any traffic onto the ring route, which is a key outcome for the duty project team. Okay, so they're fairly important things. If the deed is completed without those two things being agreed and the other party says, no, 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 go away, what leg have we got to stand on? Uh, so through the chair, in effect, the deed has the mechanisms built into it that um, shows how we will resolve those issues. So although they remain unresolved at the conceptual level at this point, that work is continuing. And then through the mechanism that the deed uh, facilitates, we would then have to agree to any changes to that design or what that design finally looks like. And there are multiple agreement points throughout the mechanism of the deed to allow that to happen. Are we on the right side this time? Or? Uh, what, what the right side what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. We're in the box seat, I think that's one of them. Um, does anyone else have any um, questions or comments on this? Otherwise, we'll go back to Councillor Moran as the mover. No. Oh, so can I put that? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Thank you, members. Um, item number 13, and I'd over number 2, proposed variation for approved plans for expansion. Councillor Corbell. Thank you. Chair. I think we have an alternative. Uh, you have a motion that's not as printed, so we're getting that up on the screen. Yes, this was circulated to elected members. So, um, members, uh, some of you may have already had an opportunity to have a look at it. If you haven't, it's up there. Can I get a seconder, please, Councillor? Pardon? Well, we need a seconder first. This is an amendment, is it? This is an alternate motion, alternative oh, motion. And it was circulated um, this afternoon, but let me just give you an opportunity oh, to read it. From, um, from administration, is no, it? No, from uh, Councillor Corbell. Oh, okay. So if I can um, indicate to you, it's, um, it's to... Uh, as you recall, this, this um, agenda item relates to the installation of a, a retaining wall, uh, add that over number two. Councillor Corbell's amendment is that the retaining wall be restricted to, a, to the height necessary. 
Um, the next restriction is that the pathway alongside that remains an unsealed pathway. Um, there was some discussion about it being bitumenized. Could you keep scrolling? Uh, requests clarification from the state regarding the future intentions of Adelaide Oval Number Two. So those are the three propositions that uh, Councillor Corbell is putting. Can I have and a second? One, isn't it? No, no. No, that's not there. Can I can I have a seconder for those propositions? Thank you, Councillor Moran. So, um, Councillor Corbill, thank you. Talk yes. us through it. Okay. Well, look. Um, really, the main point of difference between this and the original recommendation is about um, the four metre wide pathway remaining unsealed rather than sealing the surface, um, and then. Point two talks to the future use of that site. So just seeking clarification from the state government about what their intentions are for um, Oval, Adelaide Oval Number 2. It should be the SMA actually, not state government. Oh, no, forward. Council Moran, a seconder. <laughs> Councillor Moran, a second. Oh, yes, that's um, two very good points. I mean, we've been discussing, all that, like councillors have been discussing uh, those two points and we're settling on um, blonde bitumen, but uh, if the Southwark Council wants to leave it uh, unsealed, who are we to disagree? Well, yeah, if I can just um, speak uh, briefly from the Chair, as I understand it, that was always the intention, uh, was to retain that as a soft surface rather than a hard surface, and I think um, this has uh, been picked up so that we want to retain that. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, thank you, Chair. Um, I have um, some sympathy for what's being suggested here, but there's an overarching uh, point that needs to be made here. This is the second time in two months that council committee has been asked to make a recommendation about a matter which has not yet been before APLA, right. so that the effect is that APLA has the decision from council before it provides the advice to us, which must naturally be tainted. Um, it seems to me that we diminish APLA every time we do this. We I should. Can I get some sure. Sure. No. No. Well, I, I understand. That's explained. It's explained that this is happening because there isn't sufficient time, and it will come back to council. But I think the principle that we agreed last time was that APLA is important. That we value its advice and consideration of these matters, and we should give them the opportunity to make a recommendation to us, which will undoubtedly be influenced by the points that have been raised here. So my view is that this ought to be the subject of an amendment saying that the matter is deferred until APLA has considered it on the 19th for consideration by council on the 23rd, I think it is. It's the next council meeting, is that right? Or? Yeah. yeah. Um, having said that, um, uh, and, and perhaps in support of that, this is pretty controversial. I mean, we, we actually, those uh, councillors who came along went on a walk um, with um, uh, Stadium Management Authority late last year and inspected the site. We were shown uh, what it was going to look like and explained it was explained to us how the road would remain as it was and there was no need for retaining walls uh, and some 20 trees would disappear, a few of which were significant. Um, and now we seem to have project creep. Um, we have now gone to removal of the trees um, uh, construction of a retaining wall about a metre high and the construction of a bitumized road. And if you read the documents further, it's expected that this bitumized road will carry traffic from the car park and the northern area of the stadium on event days and feed it into Montefiore Road. Now, I haven't even seen in the documents any explanation of what the implications are for our roads. Uh, or indeed for safety, and I, I am aware that this matter has been raised previously with SA Police and there was a negative response about the possibility of diverting traffic uh, off the oval in that manner. So, look, it seems to me that uh, this requires a, a much more expert eye and, and frankly, um, I, I will move if this fails that the matter be deferred until it's considered by Apple. I can move that now. Councillor Martin, just... Um Oh, that, that was going to be my question. Would you like to move that now? Would you also like to ask administrative... Well, can I perhaps ask for administration comment on the effect of a deferral? Just to... Um, would there be any difficulty with the deferral is my question. And then we'll move back to you, Councillor Martin, if you wish to make a, a deferral motion. Um, 
Through the chair, I might just introduce Alex Gay from Oxygen. He might he has some clear understanding of the time frames around the construction projects. Yeah, no. Through you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, so the project's out for tender right now. Um, it's gone to three contractors. Um, obviously, the SMA want to move um, as soon as possible on this. My understanding is that the first scope they want to do is uh, do some of the turf works for moving the wicket so they can get the grass growing as soon as possible um, and then cause a little disruption to football season as football trains on Oval number two. Um, so, yeah, I guess from their point of view, they would say as soon as possible, but obviously we have to go through the approval Can I process. Question, Jim? Um, just after, after me, from our administration, um, a deferral to get to APLA, just I don't know when the next APLA meeting is. Thursday. Okay, so that could get us back to the next council, council meeting, so it wouldn't actually slow us down. Um, uh, Councillor Martin, do you wish to move a motion, move an amendment? Um, yeah, look, I, I'm sorry, Councillor Corbett, but I, I would just propose that uh, the matter be deferred until it's considered by APLA at its meeting on February 19th, 18th, and uh, returned to Council um, uh, for discussion and a uh, slash approval on the 23rd. Seconded by Councillor Abiyad. Respect to that, Councillor Martin. <coughs> No, I have done. I'm, I'm happy uh, to leave it there. Councillor Abia, do you wish to speak to that? No, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, members, it's a deferral. Councillor Wilkinson, do you wish to speak to that? On the, on, the, on the deferral, is there any opportunity to convey what Councillor Corbell was trying to convey to, to Asla? Sorry, I put She's on that. I'm on that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but there's also the option of this long bitch, I mean, if the government don't have to go to the yeah. 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 road, then we, we don't have to go to the no, black bitch, then we go to the long bitch. So, so Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Moran, did you have your hand up as well? Uh, but just to say that the deferral, um, just doesn't slow anything down because this isn't a, a you were saying that speed is the essence and blah 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 like the deferral this this isn't a decision making um committee i mean it is a decision making committee but it still has to go to council to get ratified so you can't do it nobody can do anything until the council meeting anyway so we might as well give APLA the courtesy of considering their opinion do any other members wish to speak before I hand back to Councillor Martin to start Councillor Corbett? Yeah, I see that as well. Um, I do sit on APLA and I will raise it at APLA and I'm keen to hear what the other APLA members have to say about this before um, it goes to Council. Thank you, Councillor Corbett. Councillor Martin, do you wish to speak? So can I put the um, deferral motion, all those in favour? All those against? Carried. Thank you. No, no, okay. uh, so that now becomes the motion as a uh, standard motion. So can I put that? All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Um, oh, retail strategy. Uh, item number 14, Lord Mayor, the City Retail Strategy Six Months Progress Report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a received note, so I'm going to get straight to the point and be fairly quick. Um, the, uh, everything in the report is self-evident. My questions are a little more about the end of year, full year report due in July 2016 this year, I believe. Uh, it is a question to administration. Um, have we ever done any work in terms of quantifying the economic value of public holiday trading? Uh, and will that be contained within the full year report? Now, we, we know in terms of participation rates, and I read that, there's going to be some numbers in terms of participation rates of retailers who are trading on public holidays. But do we have any sense, or have we done any work in terms of quantifying the sales value, the economic value, the employment value of public holiday trading in the city of Adelaide since it was launched? Uh, through the chair, no, at this stage we haven't got anything on, on the case, but we'll follow up with some people that I've been looking at some other benchmarking that may be able to flow through on that, on that topic. Okay. Chair, my only comment would be if that could be incorporated into the full year report, I think it would be a very worthy issue because to my knowledge also, uh, David, is that, uh, there doesn't seem to have been a body that's done any work to quantify its economic value to the City of Adelaide. And I think it's a terrific competitive advantage for the City. And I think I'd like my fellow members to be able to quantify that. Through you, Chair, sorry. 
I, I believe the best we can do is commit to making our best efforts in that. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. The measurement is problematic and we are having difficulties in measuring the overall contribution of the sector to the city's economy as we speak and we'll make our best efforts in that. Thank you, Mayor. Lord Mayor, would you like to move that? that uh, so yes, I'll, I'll, I will, well, uh, that just can be taken yeah, on but notice, to, I think, but, but I'll, move I'll, the I'll move the recommendation as printed. Okay, Thank do you. I have a seconder? Is it, no? Councillor? Mm -hmm. Councillor Antic? Thank you. Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak to the motion any further? Yeah. No, I don't, Chair. Councillor Antic, a seconder? Um, any other members? Councillor Wilkinson? Councillor Malani? I uh, just in looking at the report, and I read about this in the media, it's just it's interesting to note that Pacific Supermarkets, who develop the house gas rental place development, actually sold for four hundred million dollars. That's the biggest sale of me. And they destroy the original house gas building that built on the heritage list. Lindy's Lane, where Axel Beer's menswear was. I remember there's a thing that the council, the council put in one million dollars to save all those red that would have made that lane. You now that motion didn't get up. So We've got a big concrete box that they've uh, bought from council the land of the car park for a lot less than that and they've gone sold it. So um, I think it's a shame. It's great to get the retail thing, but you know, Adelaide's poorer for um, having lost you know, all of that character and other more, which is part of the change. Mm -hmm. yes. I just want to pick up, um, thank you, Chair, on the Lord Mayor's point. Just to, I know that there's a um, a report card coming on, on the, at the 12 month point. But the quantifiable data for not just public um, holiday trading, but for a lot of these measures would be really, really welcome because that speaks, you know, a thousand words. So, um, yeah, if we could just focus on that, that'd be great. Through Chair, if I may comment. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, we'll, again, we'll make best efforts in that. But if I could just uh, give an example of the challenges of quantifying overall revenue. There are retail chains, of course, in the city who have other uh, operations across the state. They report data in, uh, at the whole of state level. They don't break it down to uh, suburbs, if you like, and, and centres. And that's a, an example of the challenge that we're running through at the moment as we do make our best efforts to quantify the, the overall turnover. Thank you. Um, Unless anybody else wishes to speak to this, I'll put it back to the Lord Mayor to sum up. Thanks, Chair. I'm going to sum up by saying that 4.5% increase over previous 12 months in terms of retail sales is pretty pretty good. Um, it's uh, retail is trending in a better direction. Uh, so I look forward to this full report for the 12 months to look at all of the outcomes and the measurables, as Councillor Mulaney said, uh, in the full report in July 2016. So summed up. Can I put that item? All those in favour? All those against? Carried. Thank you. Members, that brings us to um, the item of the night. Um, other business, yes. Councillor Martin, motion on notice, yes. Rainbow Walk in Light. Thank you, Chair. Who's the one that's going to get in the paper tomorrow? <laughs> I, well, I don't know. <laughs> don't know. I I'm guess it depends on the outcome. It's already had her on the bus. Yeah, it's already had her. Perhaps Councillor Wilkinson or Moran might. Second this for me, that would be great. Okay, so uh, moved by um, Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin. <laughs> uh, well, look, it's a funny thing. I heard the name Councillor Sims, and I've got to tell you, members, that uh, this motion does have a connection. Yes, it does. Um, really? It's, really? Yes, it's been raised by him uh, with me on a number of occasions. But the, uh, the matter has also been raised by the, uh, the community generally. The LGBTIQ community has said to me on a number of occasions, as recently as last night, what, what is going on? You started talking about this last February. You agreed to do it last August and you haven't done it, um, is it ever going to happen? And so uh, my intention is to tell them that although we haven't done anything in August, September, October, November, December, January, February, um, we will now do something of a temporary nature um, to say, look, here, here is the work to be done. That's the, uh, what the motion does here. Um, but having had a discussion with the administration, I realised that uh, the motion that I put was flawed in that it proposes something that is temporary and inferior 
to what is proposed um, and that uh, it would be better to have that complex job uh, which is more substantial, which involves new paving and proper polyurethane finishes and the like completed in November. But that leaves us with the problem of the, uh, the community. And so what I'm suggesting and what I'd like to propose uh, that somebody move as an amendment um, is that we do both, that we provide a temporary um, painted surface and then complete as planned in November the more substantial process that does require a public consultation process. I have one question that I want to clarify though. Um, if, if I am able to um, persuade my colleagues here that a temporary painted surface and the proper job is to be done, um, is it possible to do it within the budget that's allocated by council? Through the chair. That's our understanding. Thank you. So yes. we could do a, a, a quickie paint job which will satisfy the community that's worried and then we can do the proper job later on. Um, okay, we'll look up. Sorry. No, no, I've, I've, I've finished uh, uh, and I'm happy with what Sandy is going to say. Uh, just one moment, because um, the seconder, Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, thank you. Um, having been the seconder of Councillor Sims' original motion, I'm happy to second this again and, and just state for the record that um, this, this activity and my seeking has no reflection on any views about the gay marriage thing. We were bombarded with a whole lot of uh, um, people uh, bombarding us stuff about gay marriage and the bare position on that. Um, this, in my view, has got nothing to do with that completely separate issue. I, I just think it's a good thing to do for that part of the community and it's a, a fun thing to do. So, um, in, in the second, I'm just reiterating that this has got nothing to do with that federal federal issue. Um, and uh, we hope that any of the people out there um, uh, about to bombard us with uh, any uh, adverse emails appreciate that point. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Vershaw, I'd like to move an amendment um, that I request you. Oh, you've got it there? Um, so do I have a plate? So it's completing the temporary uh, as endorsed within the budget. Sorry, is that some extra work there? Councillor Vershaw, is that what's on the board reflective of what you're asking for? Okay. Do I have a seconder for Councillor Vershaw's amendment? Thank you, Councillor Carrion. Councillor Vershaw. Um, just having spoken with uh, Councillor Martin earlier, if we can um, do something that is temporary of nature within the period that so it's ready in time for the March festival season, plus complete the um, the full project within the budget um, as per the papers, then I'm satisfied that would be a good thing to do at this time. Councillor Clarahan seconded. Um, Councillor Abia. Thank you. And just to, in speaking to the amendment, we've taken into account both budgets. First, I'd like to ask a question. The decision of council was committing to the project, but not committing to any budget line. It was clearly stating that with costing options presented to council for considerations, so can I get some clarity on that first through you, Chair to Administration? We don't have a budget allocation for this. We are awaiting some costing options. Is that correct? It's all true. Through the Chair, um, the project funding of 90000 was put through the first financial proposal, which was approved by Council at the end of November. The intent was to then bring back more detailed costings as the project progressed and we went to more detailed design. Well, it was clearly stated at that meeting uh, that Council was looking for, and the reason we put costing options in there is because we wanted to understand what other options will be available also for the community to co contribute or other people that are looking at co contribution within Council. So, look, I'm not supportive of this because the timeline, I don't understand the rush for starters. Uh, the timeline for this is very clear. We have administration advice that's provided clarity on construction documentation, on a tender process that's required, and it's part of our policy position of what we need to do, and for installation to be completed in October 2016. And taking all that into account, um, I don't understand the rush. 
um, it's in there, it needs to be done, it will be done in time. And for us to be able to put our resources into this, I'm guessing we're gonna to have to uh, stop other projects or put other projects on hold to be able to complete this. Um, so I just wanna be able to get some clarity on how we will be able to rush this. And if we can rush this, why can't we rush every other project within council and do it within three months? And why is this of a priority project for us? That's just a question. <laughs> is it a rhetorical question? Sort of, to some degree. <laughs> I mean, let's, do, let's do every other project in two months and three months if we're capable of doing that. I just I'm think. I'm saying that because I'm just doing a temporary one in two months. Thanks, Councillor Moran. Oh, um, no. Okay, so no, is it a rhetorical no. question? It's a rhetorical Thank question. Councillor Malani, do you wish to speak? Yeah, my question is, um, I'm not sure what a, a, I'm assuming temporary painted means, just paint on the street. Why can't we, that, that's what uh, that's what I envisage almost the permanent one being. Yeah, that sounds that. great to me, and I will give us a few wines and we'll get some paint and off we'll go. <laughs> right, we'll get some administrative comment on what might be workable here. Through the chair, look, the short term version will give us that. We will get a temporary installation, which will give us a rainbow for us to celebrate um, what we need to celebrate. Um, the problem with that will be that it won't last and we'll be reapplying it because it's a crappy finish. It's a lower space, quick and easy. Um, just on that, can you repaint it? Can we get 10 temporaries for the cost of one permanent? I mean, I'm trying to. I guess look, looking at it through the process we've developed, which is in the, which is in the response, to, to get a, a permanent um, application of this, that's what we've come up with and that's, that's our best advice. So it's a permanent solution so we don't have to keep maintaining it. A painted finish, depending on the specification, will lead to more maintenance. And so what we're trying to do is balance the, the achievement of both. I get what you're saying, Daniel, but look at that, um, that street near, through the university which is painted, it looks awesome. That looks great to me. I don't. You're telling me that was you know, that's the permanent version, or because I actually don't mind the concept of splashing paint out and then and moving it around and you know having that like a quicker, cheaper approach. Look, that is definitely one option. I'll be frank. We can do that. If you look at other other painted um, applications like Bank Street in particular, that's probably reapplied on the pavement yearly, probably sometimes more than that. It's touched up, so it actually takes time and resources to do that. We've got to close the street. We probably don't have that issue in Light Square there, but it's it's certainly just a, a, a bit of a, what's the word? It's an inconvenience because you have to close down that little pathway, you have to have people painting. And so the idea is to get a permanent installation there, but not much more. $90,000 is, is an inconvenience in a way, because, and, and this is going on a street that doesn't have traffic, an area that doesn't have traffic. <coughs> I've been through that conversation. Um, I guess picking up on Abiad's point about this was coming back, this was always meant to come back to us as to options. We could actually have a lot of quicker, cheaper option and tick both boxes here. That's what I think. I'm just going to foreshadow that somehow. Thank you, Councillor Now, we've got pretty much everyone wishing to speak, so I'm going to start Councillor, uh, the, the Lord Mayor, Councillor Martin, Councillor Moran, Councillor Antic. Um, members, this is Public Realm Enhancement on the run. Um, we have in front of us a series of milestone dates as communicated by our administration that on the 17th of March, APLA will be consulted. Did we not just say, members, that APLA must be consulted on projects prior to which they come to committee and council? Are we being a little hypocritical, members? Stakeholder engagement, February, March this year. Costed options, consideration April this year. Construction documentation, May this year tenders July this year and we'll get the job done by October this year. Why are we doing public realm enhancement on the run and why members are we potentially being so hypocritical? I do not support this. I do support the project but I do not support a quick fix. Our own expert administration has told us it won't last. We'll probably be repainting it again within a month. It is just silly. Can we just stick to the program please members? Councillor Martin, thank goodness you're next. Thank you. Look, uh, all of these objections are objections that I've heard in another guise at other times. Councillor Aviad, as we know, was an opponent of the concept of a rainbow walk. Councillor Antic, who's queuing up to speak. That's is not, not true. true. That is not no, true. No, on record, I refuse to hear this on record. That is not true. That is to be corrected. I, I put through the amendment clearly to state I'd like to see funding options and I supported it in principle. Just one moment. It's true for me. Anyway, 
Um, <laughs> personal answer. Uh, advisor men are allowed to invite you to withdraw that comment. Because I was against it. No. You change your mind at the very beginning. No, 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 that's not true. Councillor Moran. Withdraw, go on. Look, Chair. I'm, 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 in, I'm in allowed to invite you to withdraw that comment. Uh, okay, look, Chair, I mean, for the sake of being distracted by this, I will no, withdraw. No, for the sake of the truth, you withdraw the comment. I will withdraw the comment. That's Thank you, Councillor Moran. Carry on. I will say, however, that through the debate, Councillor Abiyad often argued against the concept of a rainbow walk. That's also inappropriate and incorrect. Yeah, and I well, think it's also, uh, Councillor Martin, if I can just move to the, it's, it's beyond the, it's beside the point, I think. So can we move to, to their sort of standard no, it's issue? Not, it's not beside the point, because the point that I'm trying to make is that the old opponents have come out again, and the issue is that there is a problem with a rainbow walk. There is a problem with a rainbow walk, and that is that we have been mucking about to the point where the community itself is saying to us, well, are you dinkum or are you not? Are you going to do it? Now, we have in our capacity um, the chance to go there and to provide something as a measure of goodwill that says on the surface that is there, this is where the Rainbow Walk will go, this is what it looks like, and of course there is the, uh, the opportunity to inform people what the final product may resemble. The fact of the matter is, however, that the project that's proposed in funding that has been approved and which I would draw to the attention of members who seem to be arguing about whether or not the funding has been approved is listed in the Finance and Business Services Committee papers to be carried forward. The funding is there approved. It says yes, next to the, uh, the column on the right hand side in the Finance and Business Services paper, the funding is there. With that funding, we are going to reconstruct that area. It is proposed that there will be new pavers, since the pavers that are there are due for replacement, and that there will be a new shape associated with the Rainbow Walk. Now, that project is understood. What I'm proposing is, in the context of there being great dissatisfaction with Council over this matter, that we do a quicker, easier, lighter, small solution that will please a significant part of our community in preparation of the bigger project, which will be delivered in November, and that in the process, we will maintain and keep the trust of uh, an important part of our community. It, it's not complicated, but there are those at this table who are trying to make it more complex and difficult than it seems. And to suggest that this is a uh, public realm activity on the run, is um, you know, breathtaking. Uh, again, we're talking about an activity of a few thousand dollars that will do some immeasurable business with the LGBTIQ community in Adelaide. If that is a problem for the members who wish to speak against it, go for it. You'll be judged out in the community by what you say. Thanks, Councillor Martin, Councillor Moran, Councillor Antic. No, I don't know what to do. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I was a full supporter of the Rainbow Crossing. If the um, LGBTIQ community wants it, I was happy to go along with it. I did say that it was unnecessary. I think um, all of those um, minority groups are well recognised and treated with respect in South Australia. Having said that, when the thing when the debate was being debated, I completely took it back. The, the vicious mail that we got from anti, from homophobic people, and I'm quite happy to um, link it to gay marriage. Um, really, I mean, I suppose it is both the topics of the time that Rainbow Crossing kind of was a little bit. Um, but yeah, I was horrified by the the volumes of hate mail and um, uh, response we had. I had no idea that there were people in South Australia like that, so that's when I decided I think perhaps we do need a rainbow crossing. Ninety thousand dollars. I'm afraid I'm a bit with Natasha. Um, <coughs> let's um, put something a bit more cheap and cheerful. I mean, the, the coloured papers do not work. Years ago, we um, maybe you remember we did uh, Hindley Street with red and white papers, and it was going to be funky and uh, and great. Well, it wasn't funky and great. You can't, the red papers faded almost immediately and it now is just light grey papers. So I'm a little bit on side to have a, a, a cheaper one. And that's where I would approve, uh, I would, could possibly vote for a temporary one if we weren't going for a $100,000 permanent one. I think that's ridiculously expensive um, when we're asking for not a rate freeze. So I, I'm not sure what to do. 
Councillor Antic, just bearing in mind what we were debating here, just have a look at the. I don't know, no, 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 I do. I do. Oh, thank you for the clarification. Um, yeah, I took an interesting position in the sense that I, um, at the time, and Councillor Martin is quite right, which is lovely. Um, and I'm, just, no, I'm commending because he's quite right. I did vote against it, and I did so on the curious position of having been shocked and appalled by some of the deputations we had, which suggested that somehow colours were damaging to children's rods and cones. Uh, and somehow dangerous, which oh. did not, you remember that? Which did not, <laughs> did not seem to resonate. But also thinking, um, as uh, Councillor Moran says, this is an extraordinary amount of money to spend on a public art project. I mean, uh, Councillor Abia made the point earlier that if this was a, uh, you know, a giant Chinese lantern in Chinatown, we would ask them to co-fund. So why are we not doing that here? Um, I, I just. You know, and, and also, this is this is public realm on the run. I mean, it clearly is. We've had Councillor Martin tell us this afternoon that he wants an item put back to Appler, and, and but not this one, not this one. Still got still hasn't been further. Well, anyway, so <laughs> no, I don't support this. And uh, but I did quite enjoy Councillor Moran on Channel Seven uh, at the time, um, uh, project managing and costing it um, by suggesting that we could be done for I don't know ten. Um, yeah, and so that's quite reasonable. That's quite reasonable in the sense. But I no, look, I I, I don't support this. Does anyone else wish to ask a question? Yes, you may have asked a question. Um, I'm just wondering, can someone please remind me at what time of the year the feast festival is? And was this project done to be done in in line with November feast? Is that correct? Is that right? Is it November? It's a while March. Um, Councillor Cameron, you reserve your right. Unless anybody else wishes to speak on this item. <coughs> you reserved your right. Um, then, Councillor Gershaw, this is your amendment. Do you wish to speak to it? Okay, so can I put the amendment? All those in favour? All those against? Are we allowed to call a division? Division, yeah. Oh, 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 change my quote then. <laughs> <laughs> Does it mean a division? Yeah, so that's about. Do you want me to do that? Amendment? Yeah, sorry, we've asked to, asked to do that again. All those in favour of the amendment? Right. All those against the amendment? Can you put your hands up nice and high? That's lost. Division. Division. That's Division. Division has been called. Those voting in favour of the amendment, please rise. Councillor Clarehand, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Martin, Councillor Fisher, and Councillor Corbell. Um, so that's declared eighth, and um, so where does that leave us going? Oh, did you? Um, okay, so that, that turns us back. That brings us back to the original, which is moved by Councillor Martin. And Councillor Milani wishes to speak to that, so does Councillor Abia. Thank you. Um, look, I just don't want to um, confuse the discussion around supporting the Rainbow Crossing versus not supporting the Rainbow Crossing. I, I want. I, I clearly support. I do support the Rainbow Crossing. I just don't support us doing a temporary project and then doing it again. And 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 whilst we're in the midst of a process. I'm okay with a bit of public realm enhancement on the run if it means lighter, quicker, cheaper painting streets. But in this instance, we have a process. We're looking towards a um, something that's going to recognise um, this um, this community, and I just don't want to interfere in that process. But I do very much support the concept of a rainbow crossing. So we've got a number of people who wish to speak to this. Councillor Abbott. Yeah, it doesn't I'd like to move an amendment. Uh, that the Economic and Community Development oh, Committee recommends to Council yeah. Yeah. Uh, that Council uh, yeah, basically notes um, Council decision on the 27th of January, which basically resolves for us to uh, go ahead with this project and part two of it, and I'll connect that with the Lord Mayor, is to proceed as planned on this project as recommended by administration. So I need a second to someone who hasn't already spoken. You second a point, that's point of order. That just seemed to be a complete direct negative oh, of the entire motion. 
procedure. No, it's not. But, um, it's, um, because it's basically completely cancelling out the original motion, going back to a previous decision of council. So I think that the, the, the uh, members should just urge people to vote against it, but to move an amendment that completely... Thanks, Councillor Wilson. Cancel we get the point, so let's get some advice from our secretary. <laughs> I need some assistance here from Daniel and Angela. On oh, the surface of it, it looks like an extension to that which has already been requested, not a negative. So just a correction, sorry, notes the council decision on the 25th of August 2015. Apologies, I read the wrong line. And two proceeds as planned on this project as recommended by administration. And I'll seek a seconder on that. No, we haven't spoken to the amendments. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're seeking a second of somebody who hasn't spoken yeah, to I haven't spoken. So, seconded by Councillor Corbell. No, no, no. Can I, through the chair, can I ask a question? Um, can we allow the um, movement seconder to speak and then I'll come to you, Councillor I'm, I'm happy to, Councillor Perrin, ask a question if it's a question of clarification on my motion. Is that what it is? Or I just wanted to find out whether um, this will address the concerns raised by the Lord Mayor, i.e., that this matter also goes. Through yep, so just a direct answer to that. Uh, this will take into account item 5 on page 181, which basically goes through an APLA consultation, stakeholder engagement, everything, the whole process. So, uh, look, members, just to be very brief on this, I think we've spoken enough. I just want to note again on record uh, that I am supportive of a rainbow crossing in the city and a celebration of diversity in the city of Adelaide. And I spoke, uh, I was very active in that regard, and I've gone on record on council and in the media in support of the specific. Uh, this specific motion. Uh, the one thing I had an issue with all along was the costing exercise and how do we go about costing it. And one of the ideas I did have at the time was to, for us to go out and do a crowdfunding exercise to have the community engaged in the process and for them to be part of that fundraising uh, aspect. I still think $90,000 is, is ridiculous and I do think is definitely cheaper ways to do it. And look, I'm hopeful that through the construction documentation process and through the tender process that we're able to go out and get um, good outcomes that are cheaper than 90,000. I think it's important that we uh, um, we deliver that to our rate payers, especially that some councillors are talking about a rate freeze discussion. Um, and we keep, from what I'm seeing, spending money uh, without uh, figuring out how we're allocating those specific funds. Uh, so look, I'll ask members to, um, to support this. This is the proper course of action that we take on any project within council. Um, and this is something that we could focus on and do our stakeholder engagement process, get the project costed, do the tender process properly, and then deliver the project as requested and as required uh, without having to cut corners. Uh, and I'll ask members to support Councillor Corbell, a second. Thank you, Chair. Yes, look, looking at the time frame, going back to... Going back to um, the decision in... Chair, people are talking. No, no. Members, can I have your attention, please? Thank you. Going back to the decision in August, we um, the motion was calling for the project um, to be delivered in 2016. So the expectation of the community isn't that it's going to be rushed and delivered by March, or that it's going to be done. No, not necessarily. It's not saying it has to be done quickly. It, it's it's really still it's only February 2016. And we only allocated money to this project no. in November last year. We have been provided, no, in November. Okay. We approved the project and the funding was approved in November. And so now we're coming back with, with information about the timeline, which is quite reasonable. We don't have to spend $90,000 on this. We've allocated $90,000, but we want to take it to APLA. We want to get their ideas around it. We want to consult with the community. We want to get people on board. There might be possible sources of other funding. And then with that, support broader, more broadly from the community. I think that this time frame is quite reasonable. It, the project will be delivered by the um, by October next year, uh, by, by October this year. And um, we follow a due process with engaging stakeholders and um, delivering a project in a timely manner. Thank you. 
Thanks, Councillor. Well, now, members, just bearing in mind that we've, I think we've really have aired most of the issues here. Does anybody else wish to speak to the amendment? Look, just Martin? briefly, Chair, to say um, I understand it, it seems to be the mood of the committee that there be no temporary measure and that the long-term larger project be delivered with the funding that was previously approved and therefore I will support the amendment that's proposed on the basis that my original motion on notice which would become the substantive is for. So um, I would just urge everyone to support uh, Councillor Abbey Arts Amendment. Right. Um, anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Abbey, do you wish to sum up? Okay, so can we put the amendment, please? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. I'm oh, sorry, that's become all, all those against. That's carried. Um, and so that becomes the motion as amended. Um, so can I put that, please? All those in favour of the amended motion? Again, that. All those against? The one I avoid. That. <laughs> Okay, um, members, that brings us um, I think to other business. Does anyone have any other business? There being no other business. Oh, sorry, no other business. Just I meant to record the um, apology from Councillor Slammer. <laughs> that was that was good. It was taken for that was taken from previously was and, and is recorded has been recorded in the minutes. Thanks, Thank Councillor Wilkinson. Okay, um, that brings us to item 18, which is a, a um, exclusion. Can someone move it, Councillor Abbeyard? Moved by Councillor Abbeyard, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Can I put the exclusion motion? All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. So can I ask that all members of the public um, in the gallery and all those not directly, anybody who's not directly related to this agenda item, please leave the Colonel Light Room so that we can consider this in confidence. Thank you.
very much for your time. Um, we now have to um, reopen the Charlie, quick. Well, can we have a really short mark then because he has to go to the in the future? So <laughs> 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 now that we've seen the doors being opened, we're back on uh, our television screens. Um, I just declare the meeting closed. Thank you for your patience and your <laughs> Councillors, I'll declare the Finance and Business Services Committee meeting open at 7.53 p.m. And I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on a traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge our continuing importance to the Ghana people within today. We have an apology from Councillor Slala. Uh, can I have someone please move the confirmation of the minutes? Thank you, Councillor Moran, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Any debate? If none, I'll put it to you. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. <laughs> we don't have a public forum. Um, I will not bore you with the Chair's verbal report. I'll uh, move directly to the selection of appointments uh, of a Deputy Chair. And I'd ask the CEO to call for nominations, Deputy Chair of Finance and Business Services. Well, I call for nominations on uh, Councillor Martin. If you'd like to nominate yourself? Correct. Okay, so we have a nomination to Councillor Martin. I'm guessing, I'm guessing you accept, Councillor. Yes, any sorry. other any other nominations? Be it that there's none. Um, I put a uh, I'm guessing someone to put a motion to endorse uh, for Councillor Martin to be nominated uh, as the Deputy Chair of Finance and Business Services, moved by Councillor Clarehan and seconded by Councillor Moran. I put this to you. Any all those in favour? All those against? That item is carried. Items for adoption on block. Uh, we have a verbal presentation in relation to the Adelaide Central Market uh, Authority, so we'll bring that about. Uh, item 9 and 10, I'm guessing we're going to have a, a discussion uh, around those. Um, item 11, end of quarter 2, 15-16 business plan, Councillor Martin. And then we have an out of session information paper in relation to notice of engagement of research activities. So we're not withdrawing that. Excellent. So we will go directly to our item eight, verbal presentation. There's nothing with more. Uh, there's nothing uh, no uh, So verbal presentation, according to Capital Works update. Uh, and I'd like to invite um, a chair of the Adelaide Central Market, uh, Mr. Nick Picardis, and uh, Aaron Brumby, general manager of the Adelaide Central Market, to join us. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. I hope you enjoyed the uh, last committee. <laughs> and um, so we have a, ver a verbal presentation from you both. Please, you've got the uh, you've got the mic, so take us on. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for your time tonight. Our presence here tonight is uh, part of our ongoing commitment to present progress on planned uh, infrastructure at the Adelaide Central Market and to give councillors the opportunity to ask uh, questions. The vision of the Adelaide City Councillors and Council Administration, that of making the Adelaide Central Market the best fresh produce market in the world, is a vision enthusiastically shared by the ACMA Board. We're well on the way with the infrastructure works we have in hand to report to you or plan over the next uh, five years or so. Uh, this is in conjunction with the re-establishment of the central market as a community centre, coupled with experiential shopping and through a comprehensive and alternating range of interactive on-site uh, activities. ACMA consider the infrastructure that is the Adelaide's central market a community asset and the strategies in place and planned 
to make this a reality for all Adelaideans and South Australians. And the once in a lifetime opportunity presented by the potential redevelopment of the Adelaide Central Market Arcade can position the market district as a world leading precinct, making a significant contribution to the strategic outcomes sought by council and the state government for this city. I now ask our general manager, Aaron Brumby, to present on progress on the Capital Works Program for this financial year. Following Alan's uh, presentation, will be available for uh, any questions. Over to you, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, I'll be speaking to the presentation on the screen uh, at the moment. If I can ask for slide two. Uh, just a quick recap. Um, we have uh, 19 Capital Works projects to complete uh, at the central market this financial year. Uh, 14 on the market floor itself and five within the car park. Uh, we have a budget of 2.045 million funded by ACMA and focused on three key areas of improved ambience, best practice retail, maintenance, risk mitigation and sustainability. Uh, at uh, the end of quarter two, we have 21% of the projects completed, 47% uh, of the projects uh, commenced and the last 32% in the final uh, phases of planning um, with uh, four projects uh, mentioned in particular uh, on screen. Uh, three projects that I'd like to bring to everyone's attention, which we are working very closely with traders on, is the aisle light replacement project, uh, the accessible toilet and parents room upgrade, and the dining area furniture replacement. Uh, with these three projects, we've actually created trader work groups where we're getting a lot of trader engagement on the, uh, the type of feel, type of fittings that um, the traders feel would best suit the market with their collective experience and taking on board our technical experience on uh, going towards uh, the best type of fittings for sustainability purposes. Uh, the accessible toilet, I'd like to draw out a little bit further. This is a really important milestone for the central market. Um, we do not presently have a disabled toilet in the central market. We are looking to rectify that issue with the installation of a uh, fully compliant accessible toilet in accordance with Australian standards and the introduction of a better standard parents room. Uh, we've actually been able to draw up uh, two different options, which we are currently putting through Council Social Inclusion Committee. And then following that, we'll be going out to public consultation uh, to seek the public's uh, uh, support and suggestion as to the two options in which the public feel they would best like to see in the market, after which we'll commence construction on the project. And just finally, this is the final slide. Uh, we uh, map our projects and the timeline involved for delivery. Uh, I meet with the operations manager on a weekly basis to check where we're up to and what needs to be completed. And today we are on schedule and under budget. That's all. Thank you. We're uh, open for questions. Excellent. Members, happy to take questions from the floor. Councillor Corbell. Uh, I think this is fantastic and I like all of this, the sound of all of the projects. Just with the replacement furniture and the lighting, have you given any consideration to recycling rather than throwing away? I'm not exactly sure what your plans are there. Uh, yes, absolutely. The existing uh, tables and chairs will be incorporated into the uh, Great Street side of the market where we have a seating area um, with us placing new furniture in the Guja Street end market. So we're looking at a, a actual gain of seating capacity um, whilst not removing any of the existing uh, furniture. Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. What is the recent history of Capital Works and the Adelaide Central Market? You're spending 2.045 billion this financial year, is that my understanding, or is that over multiple years? Uh, that's for this financial year. And let's say in the last three financial years, or if not five, how much has been spent on capital improvements in the Adelaide Central Market? Uh, to my understanding, uh, the equivalent uh, amount that we're spending now has been spent over the last five years. So it's, it's been at roughly that sort of three to four hundred thousand a year. Thank you. Um, lighting can have a huge impact on the, um, on the atmosphere of, of a place. And um, uh, we'll talk about street lighting and the other councils and maybe with me going on about that. But um, there's, a, there's a bit of a trend, which I think is an unfortunate trend with lighting consultants these days to go towards very white 
um, high degree Kelvin colour temperature, which is it's often said. Do you have a question, Councillor Wilkinson? Yes, you allow me to get to it, please. Um, that um, it, it's often used as a derogatory statement. Is it's a bit like a supermarket light. We've got the fluoro lights. It's that ugly white, bluey white light. Um, now there are instances where certain merchandise you might want to sort of have a whiter light directly on the merchandise, but in the aisles themselves. You know that if, if you if you lit the entire market with this uber LED because LED is a bit warm light. Councillor Wilkinson, please get to the point. Allow me, please. Um, um, with the lighting that you're looking at, you know, you, if you what sort of colour temperature you're looking at? And are you looking at possibly having a warmer light on over the aisles and, and or is it going? Is it intended to have this sort of blue and white light everywhere? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, at the moment we have um, the uh, what are called daylight lights at 4000 Kelvin um, in high bay industrial fittings. Um, we're looking to change them over to a soft white um, that encourages the customer's eye to look towards the merchandise and the shops themselves yeah. rather than being uh, heavily illuminated from above. So you might have a less than 3000 hours and 4000 That's correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Any other questions? Be it that there's none. Thank you very much for your presentation, gentlemen. And, and we welcome uh, your visit at any time. Uh, the Chairman and the General Manager will give you a personal tour. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and for your time today. Members, I uh, will move on to item nine. However, I do have a request from administration there with some of the decisions that were discussed in prior committee for us to move item 10 to be addressed first, which is the 15, 16, quarter two revised forecast. So um, we'll go to item 10 first. And if I could have uh, someone move that. Yeah, can we have the door please opened? Apologies. Councillor Wilkinson, you're moving. Can I have a seconder please? Councillor Hender, Deputy Lord Mayor Hender. Um, Councillor Wilkinson, would you like to speak? No. Councillor Hender? You reserve your right. Anyone else? Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, I have a series of questions that flow from the, uh, the documents. Um, uh, now, the figures suggest that we have borrowings as of today of, um, or as of the 10th of February, which is the last day on which it was done, we have borrowings of $4.7 million. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. And we were budgeting at the beginning of the financial year for a deficit of... The chair, the, uh, the deficit was uh, excluding uh, carry forwards was uh, in the original budget uh, 18, sorry, 3.3 million. Yeah. Okay, so um, what would your expectation be of the surplus at the end of the financial year? Um, from page three, we sorry, page three of the revised forecast, that you'd expect the deficit at the end of the financial year or the surplus to be? Through the chair, I expect the surplus, the, uh, the, 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 the borrowings at the end of the year to be 27.6 million based on the latest forecast in this document. So uh, at this time, we have spent uh, and are in a position of having borrowings of $4.7 million. And in four months time, we will have borrowings of $27 million. So we will spend in the next four months, five times more than we have in the first eight months of the year. Uh, no, that's not correct, Councillor. Uh, Please correct the, uh, the, the figures as of today are, or as of that date were, uh, inclusive of all inflows and, and outflows, and there's uh, various inflows and outflows that happen seasonally during the year. Yep. So it's certainly not 
correct to assume that uh, that the increase or decrease in the borrowings will be uniform through the year. Uh, I, I understand that, but in the final four months of the financial year, you expect our borrowings position to change from 4.7, let's say $5 million, to $27 million. That is correct. That's the best estimate I can give you at this stage with the, the latest information from all of the managers in the organisation. Okay. okay. And um, can I clarify, because it is relevant to this, uh, the new measure of CPI that's being proposed by the administration, by the South Australian Department of Treasury and Finance, suggests 1.75% for the current financial year, 2.25% for the coming year. Um, the administration's prediction in uh, the document circulated a few weeks ago was for 1.1%, was that correct? Uh, Councillor Martin, just quickly, this is item number 10. Yep. It's this, not... This is it. No, no, item, you're, the item you're referring to, I believe, is item 9, the prelim budget assumptions, is that correct? Well, uh, no, but it relates to these documents as well. Uh, I'm coming I'm coming to the point. Because we've got a quarter to revised forecast. That's all we're noting. Yes, I know, I know, I know. I know, but there are, there are in these calculations that are relevant to the coming year. Okay, go ahead. Through the chair, the, the numbers I presented a couple of weeks ago were actual uh, figures published by the uh, Bureau of Statistics for Adelaide CPI as of September 2015. Right. The numbers uh, that you're referring to are from the State Government Tre uh, Department of Treasury and Finance, yep. uh, the mid-year budget estimate update uh, published in December 2015. They are for the, uh, the estimate for full year uh, CPI, Adelaide CPI for 15-16 uh, and the projections for 16-17 and the two years after that as well. Okay, and if I can just turn to a couple of items uh, in the documents. Um, I, I note that there is on pages 9 and 13 uh, uh, carry forwards of quite a substantial amount related to IT. Um, uh, let me see, page nine. Oh, project transfers, sorry, I think about I used the wrong word. Project transfers. On page 30, we're talking about? No. So, can I clarify the question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just want to refer you to uh, page nine and page 13. Uh, just those IT issues, uh, I can number them if you like. Uh, That's fine. Yep. Um, could you just explain those to me? Certainly, through the chair. Uh, we've actually pr provided an additional uh, attachment or schedule yep. uh, towards the, the back of the, uh, the document. In fact, it's the last schedule. What page page document. Page it's on page 30 of the distributed document, uh, page 29 and 30. Yep. Uh, there's a one-page uh, background explaining the uh, the rationale for yep. for those transfers, and then the, uh, the the prioritization that the administrator or that uh, the administration is recommending, uh, based on the principles outlined in the uh, in the uh, background document. Uh, yep. Page 29. And, and uh, but are we able to quantify the the savings that will flow to the organisation in terms of dollars or people? Uh, look, this is a uh, this particular proposal is uh, the administration looking at the emerging uh, strategic plan of council and wanting to be smart and uh, looking at how we currently leverage information and uh, the customer experience for for uh, all the customers and staff of the council and uh, the proposals for here are as a result of uh, an internal collaboration between uh, lots of members of, of the administration to find out. Uh, uh, I guess the background to it is that the last year we had a new ICT manager join the organisation. Uh, he made a, a frank and fearless assessment of the corporate infrastructure or the information infrastructure we have and our ability to provide the information customers are wanting and it wasn't uh, growing. Um, so he's uh, led a process uh, of review 
and uh, this is the third step in that process of review. Uh, I'm not sure if the acting general manager in that area is able to add anything to that um, process that's been undertaken. Okay, thanks, Mark, and thank you for the chair. That, that's actually a very good uh, summary. Talking in general terms, uh, what we have noted through the review is that historically um, we've spent uh, ICT dollars in a way that could be described as a point solution in as much as it solves a particular problem that may not be scalable to solve problems that, uh, that might apply elsewhere in the organisation that are similar. Uh, through Peter and his team's review, they've um, determined that if we do just more foundational work, we're better able to build solutions that are actually scalable across the organisation. So uh, these particular pieces of work in isolation don't generate savings immediately, but they will into the future. And we'll bring more information uh, to members when we go through the uh, budget process over the coming weeks, as well as to, to how we plan to equip that over the, on your behalf over the, uh, the next year. Okay, good, thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Martin? Um, uh, no. Uh, uh, oh, look, uh, only an observation that the efficiency dividend uh, uh, did deliver, um, or appears to have delivered so far, um, which is great, particularly as a result Members, any other comments or questions of administration in relation to this item? Councillor? Are we going to do the defibrillator? In this, as part of this, or not? So I was not? about to, to ask Mark the question. So, Mark, is there any comments you'd like to have in relation to this um, to this item? Yes, certainly through the chair. Uh, I'd recommend uh, my recommendation would be that, there, uh, that an, uh, an amendment is moved to the to the recommendation in terms of a, a budget adjustment uh, to take account of the, should council wish to uh, to take account of the additional funding required to achieve the defibrillator's outcome. Where do you suggest council um, takes that money from? Uh, through the chair, I would recommend that that, oh, so come from. Uh, yeah. I must, can I ask a question, I guess, which provides some clarity. Those carry forwards, are they already allocated to projects or are they free? <laughs> Any money that's uh, that's in the expenditure budget in QF2, in, under the uh, QF2 on Schedule 2, yep. is allocated to the projects. Okay. So how do you propose we fund the 20,000? Just put it into the money. Can I make a suggestion? Go ahead. You've got the floor. Well, would it help if we put it into the this um, motion as a, to be considered as part of the um, revised forecast, but don't actually say where it's from. Is that would that be, or do we have to do it? Would that be the best way to do it? Mark, if I can, if I can help, uh, the the original forecast for this current year, uh, once the carry forwards are included, was for a for a deficit for the year of twenty two point nine million. The current forecast in QF two is for a deficit of seventeen point six million. So we are actually. 5.3 million better off than the original budget adjusted for carry forwards. Um, so, we, if, if the council chooses to fund this this uh, initiative, it would be uh, from borrowings, unless uh, one of the existing projects was also adjusted. So, Councillor Malani, what would you propose? Well, I'll. Um, the advice given to us in the previous committee was we do it in this process and we look at the re revised um, budget or or we take it into next year's budget. Um, the strong view from those supporting it was it came from a revised current financial year budget. I'll take some advice from... So the two options currently available are either you fund it from borrowings or you fund it through... Um, Taking it from another project. That's what Mark's advice. Or, or we we fund it. Can't we just say we fund it and and consider it and then park that? Yeah. I don't think. Then do that as a motion without noticing. I want to decide where to get it from now. Okay. Okay. Just can make it like So do you need a motion for that? Are you happy to deal with it on uh, on uh, as a side comment? <laughs> Through the chair, in the report, we'd always intended that this would um, be considered as part of the 16-17 uh, budget process. 
Um, so we've already done the paperwork to pull together a budget bid to be considered as part of that. So what I can do is take it, feed it into our internal process, and then depending where that lands, it will then come back through to council as part of your 16-17 budget deliberation. So you don't need a separate motion for that? No. Excellent. So we'll provide clarity on that. That's excellent. Let's move on. Any other debates in relation to um, item 10 for the quarter two revised forecast? Be it that there's none. Council Wilkinson to sum up. Summed up. I'll put this to you. All those in favour? All those against? That item's carried. Members, we move back to item 9, uh, which is relating to the 16-17 prelim budget assumptions. And I have a Deputy Lord Mayor Hender to look at uh, either option one, option two, or any other option she may consider in relation to this. I'm moving option one. Okay, can I seek a seconder? Councillor Corbell. Councillor Hender, you have the floor. Okay, councillor. So this is following on from our debate from uh, last week, or whenever it was, from our meeting. Um, it relates to um, to our rate revenue growth. And if I could just explain to you what, what first of all, option one is for those um, to get some clarity, and also why I think it is our preferred option. So what we're saying for option one is that we want our full rates revenue to be to be CPI. So that we will, we will um, our income from rates will increase by CPI. If we can achieve that from new developments, additions, and alterations, marvellous. If we can't achieve it from um, new developments, additions, and alterations, then what this proposes is that the rate in the dollar for existing be be increased slightly in order to um, to achieve that CPI increase. So the principle for me is that we have a CPI increase in our rates income. And let me explain why. There will be some of you, I'm sure, and I've heard this and we, we had some of this discussion, to say, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to argue this CPI increase when really it's so marginal and what we could do is we could take the benefit, you know, the PR benefit of no rate on a dollar and bank it. But I'd like you to turn your attention to page 11, uh, sorry, to paragraph 11, which indicates what the difference would be between option one and option two. So if we go with option one, our rate income next year will be 56.1. If we go with option two, our rate income next year will be 50, this is obviously this predictions, 54.9. That's a $1.2 million difference. So we're not talking about an insubstantial amount of money here. We're talking about a significant amount of money. And in my view, I, I, I take the point, if we got pretty close to CPI just with our, uh, with our um, new build, then yeah. maybe we could just bank it and, and deal with it that way. But given that the gap is over a million dollars, I don't think we can do that. I think to give away a million dollars worth of our um, income in circumstances, in, which I'll come to in a minute, in the circumstances we find ourselves in would be um, really scuppering our future. So let me just tell you about one of the things, some of the things I, I think we are facing. We have got a number of budgetary pressures coming our way. We've been advised by our administration that our expiation um, income is going to decrease and Councillor Moran, you might be interested in this because I know you're really keen that our exp expiation in income decrease. So we're going to have our expiations coming down. We've got income from our car parks that I'm advised is plateauing. So we're not going to get an increase in car park revenue. We have got, as of today, uh, the feedback that we've given to our administration, our grants and, and um, uh, sponsorships, we've indicated to our staff that we'd like them to go away and indicate how they might increase that budget line for us. So our expenditure in that area is likely to go up. And CPI, no brainer. So we've also said to them, increase that by CPI every year because that's a no-brainer. So we've got all these things coming at us and what we're proposing if we go with option two is that in addition to those budgetary pressures, we also pull $1.2 million out of our budget. And I just think that leaves us in a very vulnerable position. So um, I would really recommend um, that we go with option one. Um, what it does is it provides us with effectively a, a, a reliable income that's 
no, in real terms, no greater than our income this year. And with that, we are effectively getting a, um, an efficiency dividend because with our, uh, but with our rate in, uh, income increasing to that extent, you need to bear in mind that in 2015 calendar year, we anticipate an extra thousand people coming into the city to live. In 2016 calendar year, we have, I might have the years wrong, might be one year out, but anyway, in, in two of the calendar years, it's uh, we're, the anticipated increase in population is um, 1,300 to 1,500. So on the same real income, we would be servicing an extra 2,500 people. We would be picking up their bins, we would be making sure their garden, the city gardens were looking good, we would be addressing their roads and their, um, and, and their footpaths. And if we don't make sure we have enough income to do that, we are going to stop attracting people to our city. I think we'd be putting ourselves in a position where we'd be bringing them into a city that's not well maintained and they're going to stop coming. So in my view, it's absolutely critical to our future that we continue to, to hold our income streams so that we can provide the people with the city they should, that they can both expect and, and demand of us. I urge you to support option one. Thank you, Councillor. As a second, to Councillor Corbell. Thank you. Yeah, I'm supporting um, option one. I see it as um, a really significant difference long term. You can see, like Councillor Hand, um, the Deputy Lord Mayor pointed out, point 11, um, the potential financial impact of adopting option one versus option two um, on the long term financial plan is actually very significant. And to us right now, the decision we're making, it, it seems small. It's, it might only be a small amount of money, but the long term impact of that is very considerable. In fact, it's, mil it's millions of dollars of difference. Um, and even with option one, it's, it's going to put us behind our current long term financial plan. Now, um, financial stability, a key objective of council is financial stability, and that's long term financial stability. Um, our financial performance and our financial position. And the decision we're making today has implications for years ahead on our delivery of services to the community. I don't want to have to cut the delivery of services. I want to be able to um, continue to invest into key projects and initiatives. And I don't want to have to in the future consider, for this council, the future council consider unnecessary rate increases to make up for that shortfall. Thank you, Councillor. I've got Councillor Milani and then Councillor Moran. And then Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I don't support option one, and nor do I support option two. I think both are actually quite flawed um, in their approach. Um, and I've got a couple of questions and just a couple of statements because I think um, I don't I'm I believe that we should be having a separate conversation around growth and new development, a separate conversation around CPI as a principle and the, and the increase in cost of doing business, and a, and a conversation around how we then return efficiencies to the council. So the challenge I have with option one is it's mixing up the conversation around growth and new development and CPI. They are set fundamentally separate. Option two, what I have an issue about is um, when we talk about efficiency, we talk about growth, CPI and efficiencies, depending on what those numbers come out to be, we could potentially decrease the rate in the dollar, which if we, if our, depending on what our efficiencies could be. So I actually think we are putting the cart before the horse in all of these scenarios and that we should be taking a principle-based approach to how we um, uh, make these assumptions and then actually work up picking up a couple of points about what we're going to um, our strategic plans out for consultation what we actually want to deliver and we still have a lot of discussion to have around that and what the efficiencies are because potentially we've identified already some, some significant efficiencies and the CEO in the last um, the uh, committee uh, agreed or that he would be coming back to us with efficiency. So I actually think that it's a hybrid between one and two. I, I'm picking up the point of um, some councillors don't want to increase the, the rate in the dollar. Well, there's an opportunity maybe for us to decrease it. So 
So why are we setting ourselves in, into a, a scenario where we don't actually know yet what our options are? So I, we, we, we have actually, traditionally, we look at our costs and then we look at how we are going to look at the revenue. I would like us to be a little bit more focused on some principles. I actually think option two, I've actually got a quick question, if I may, Mark, in option two, where we're talking about fixing the rate in the dollar, but we're also talking about um, measuring in inflation assumptions and CPI and factoring that in. How, how do those two go, go hand in hand? If you're fixing the rate in the dollar, but you're also potentially factoring in CPI, can you just so give me clarity on that? Through the chair, um, the, can I just ask which point? Which point so it says point two, two. One point. One point, sorry, 1.2 under option two talks about re remaining at that current level. Okay. So and then 1.3 talks about inflation assumptions. Okay, so 1.3 through the chair is actually separate to option one or two. Options, uh, sorry. Is that what that dotted line here? Yeah. Yeah. So it has to be. <laughs> so 1.3 and 1.4 are not part of option two. It's only 1.1 and 1.2. So 1.1 and 1.2 you'll find is ah. repeated in option one and two. Okay. And then 1.3 and 1.4 stand alone. Okay, so, all right, I, I, I actually just misread the number in there, but that, okay. But I still believe that we can um, give some assumptions to enable us to do the budget, but keep our options open around uh, fixing the rate in the dollar versus looking at, when we look at efficiencies, looking beyond, we actually could, we actually have the opportunity to potentially decrease the rate in the dollar. We don't know yet. I, I firmly believe we need to know what our efficiencies are, opportunities, and knowing what we actually want to deliver. Councillor Corbell mentioned about just want to reduce service delivery. Um, Councillor Hender talked about, you know, initiatives that we need to do to attract people to come into the city. Um, so we certainly don't want to be taking a $1.2 million revenue hit, which is what option two does. Option one, to me, mur murkies the waters between growth and CPI. My firm belief is it should be growth. We, we are entitled to growth and there is a cost of doing business when we um, have to service the new growth, the new residents, the new businesses. And, and CPI is a principle of business where you factor an increase of costs of doing business and you factor that into your, your rate revenue. Why would we offset one against the other? They, those two do not correlate to me. So I think there's a flaw in both of the options. Mm -hmm. um, so I have an a, a, a amendment, if I, but I'm sorry. No, I don't have any time, sorry, yeah. Councillor. Well, I'll for, I'm gonna foreshadow an amendment that is more principle-based on what I've just if said. If this is lost. If this is lost. That's correct, so we'll move on. Councillor Moran, thank yes, you. Yes, I'd like to move the amendment. Okay. I'd like to move that the Adelaide City Council for this budget freeze the rate in the dollar. So that the Finance and Business Services Committee requests or recommends to Council that they freeze the rate in the dollar. That's so for the 16-17 budget. This is an option three. Option I'll second that. Well, as we just kept this on the board and I'll get a second to second. The Finance and Business Services Committee recommends to Council that it freezes the rate in dollar for the 16-17 budget. And Councillor Martin, you're seconding that? Oh, good pleasure. No worries. Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, look, um, as per our last um, briefing, we were told that um, CPI was 1% and uh, the Council would get 1%. Um, by uh, the uplift in new developments. So we've got that, and we argued at the time that it would be double double dipping for them to us to increase the uh, rate in the dollar by CPI for the rest of the properties. Um, uh, I've said this so many times. Um, surprising enough, we haven't revalued. I've always argued that we get our uplift when we revalue. Uh, for the first time I've ever known, we haven't revalued or recheck values for two years. Um, but that, that being said, I think we should start doing that annually again. Um, and that may lead to the situation that Tasha was talking about. We may actually drop um, our rate income um, because the Lord Mayor tells us that rental is dropping. 
Um, that combined with the fact that CPR is 1% is really an economy circling the drain. Those are not good things for rental to be dropping and the CPI to be so low. We get a very small amount from this CPI and we buy a lot of bad publicity and don't recognise that our rate payers are suffering with the highest rates that the Adelaide City Council historically has ever charged. We are now well over Walkerville and the suburbs that we used to benchmark to try and keep neck and neck. The owner occupiers lost some time ago through state government legislation their 40% um, owner occupier grant, um, which kept them um, roughly the same as other suburbs. So that's gone, and even the one off payment's gone now. So, for the first time I've ever seen, the residential areas are suffering from their rates, and people have mentioned it at every front door. I have never seen that before. Um, we're, we tend to have an old ageing population that's asset rich, cash poor, and with the other rising costs. But we haven't got low rates. There's an impression that we've got low rates, we need to put them up. It's wrong. We have high rates. Um, uh, we are a very large organisation that needs to be streamlined. Um, we have a very small ratepayer base um, compared to other council, uh, councils. We're not to be compared with other councils. The other councils got very prosperous last time when we froze the rates. We didn't freeze the rates, we froze the rate in the dollar. They rely entirely on their rate base. But they don't have big businesses, they just rate their population. We don't do that. We own car parks, aquatic centres, golf course, function centres. Um, we should never be raising the rate in the dollar. And that, that apart from a few times, it was always explained why we raised the rate in the dollar for a, for a specific thing. Stephen Yawa started it by raising it for a really green fund, but said we wouldn't do it again. But no, unfortunately, so that was me. It wasn't. Okay, well, they said about that. And then it became the convention that we raised the CPI to make the budget balance. Whereas in times gone past, better times, we froze the rate in the dollar and then made sure that our organisation and our councillors were hungry for profits through our car parks, for profits that, it's a, it's a lazy council that just puts up the rates and puts up the, the parking fines and, and does it like that. We, our car parks were bought by Mr Broche to offset, not to keep the prices of car parking down as often said, it was there to offset the rate so that we one day would actually better phase out, that was his dream, that we wouldn't have rates at all for um, residential residents and businesses. We would be such a rich council. Now for us to be falling back and to be quarrelling about a tiny little amount of money, it is just not worth, no, no, it is not 1.5 million. That is next year's budget. And if we revalue, if we revalue in the coming year, we may find that our rates go down. It is not 1.5 million. We were told last time it was in the order of 600,000. 1.2. Well, that's different information than we had at the last briefing. 1% will give us. Yeah, Councillors, so, oh, yeah, thank you for the question. Mr. Gray, so, yep. would you like to clarify that? The, the information that was provided at the uh, previous special meeting was uh, based on actuals mm -hmm. from the past, the September 2015 CPI. During that meeting, uh, it was clear that there was a, a mood to link CPI, uh, rates, uh, future rates to a measure of CPI. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went uh, away and looked for something that I uh, that would be uh, a reliable measure of CPI in future. And the, I guess the principles I was looking for was, was it consistent from year to year? Is it a reliable source of information? And is it repeatable? So uh, those were the, the principles. And, and as it happened, the, the, the state government uh, treasury uh, has a bunch of economists there that do forecasts based on uh, economic data. And uh, so what I'm proposing here is in, in 1.3 is uh, a principle that council might adopt to, to link its budget inflation assumptions to the same inflation assumptions that the state government uh, uh, provides in its budget. Um, so rather than, uh, I guess, we've had an estimate of inflation in the past, uh, and it's entirely up to council which measure of inflation it would like to do, whether it's based on past inflation or forecast future inflation. And so that's a matter that uh, you may want to discuss amongst yourselves. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Yeah, yeah. Just have a look. No, I'm not. No, no, Councillor Brown still has the floor. Yeah, okay. Uh, whether it be whatever I thought it was or 1.2 minute, the, the fact remains. Um, our, um, our populace is suffering. They've asked us to freeze the rates, rate the dollar. Most of the, when we door knock, would have, would have promised that. Um, even $1.2 million, we'd get it from some, make, it, make this council a bit hungry, make it go out and, and get that money from other places, not from fining people and raiding them. Go and, go and make our car parks the, the cash cow that they used to be. Get rid of the aquatic centre to whoever wants to take it over. But th this is lazy politics. What did uh, famous politicians say? Eventually, you will run out of other people's money. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor um, Martin, you have the floor as a second. Yes, thank you. Look, I, I support this. And just to clarify what's happened, I understand what Mark has said. But the circumstances are that one week ago, we were talking about an increase in rates of 1.1%. We're now talking 2.5%. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the, what we're talking about uh, tonight and uh, a couple of weeks ago was some assumptions that we built into the uh, into the budget that we bring back to you for, for consideration. But I am correct in saying it's double. So. But certainly, it's uh, the, the number that uh, was presented was an actual figure from September 2015. Yep. Uh, these figures tonight are based on uh, uh, a forecast of inflation for the budget year. Okay, so state. And Mark, just for the sake of clarity for this chamber, can you provide those two CPIs, the one you provided a couple of weeks ago and the one, one yeah, Certainly, through uh, this year, the actual for September 2015 was 1.1%. 1 .1%. The uh, forecast for 2016-17, published by State Treasury, is 2.25%. It's 100% more. It is not. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Mark. and look, let me add to that another figure. The LGA inflation rate is 1%. So here we are, 2.5%, double what we proposed before, and more than double the LGA rate. And uh, you know, I say it again, at the end of the 2014 financial year, we had an audit surplus of $25 million. At the end of the 2015 financial year, we had an audited surplus of $27 million. Uh, and my expectation is that we will have a surplus based on history. And, and you've already heard tonight that we're $5.3 million better off than we thought we would be at this time. So we keep asking people for money and we have lots of money. Now, uh, I just don't understand how we can go to ratepayers and keep saying we need this money uh, when our history is not one of spending the money that we get. Um, ratepayers don't get that. Uh, and I remind the Lord Mayor and others that he and I knock on doors and said, we stand for a freeze in rates. Now, I hear the argument that, you know, well, that was only one year, but it is in fact in the minds of voters, a undertaking to freeze the rate in the dollar. Now, I'm just um, really bowled over by uh, Councillor Milani's uh, conversion on the road to Damascus. I think that's sensational, Councillor Milani. I endorse most of what you said there. That's really sensational. And, and it is a big conversion because I remember getting an email from you only a few weeks ago saying that um, the story of the CPI increase is only positive. Um, so that's a sensational uh, conversion. Um, what I think ratepayers want to see is not financial stability through raising taxes, but through efficiencies that we impose on ourselves, um, that Councillor Milani and Councillor Moran referred to. Um, you will be asked to fund an increase in salaries again. We have not looked at that closely. The CEO has told us that the, the change to the director system rather than the, the, uh, the general manager's uh, structure will yield savings in his estimation of about a million dollars a year. Last year, we had a placemaking team. They cost us about $600,000. Gone, no more. $1.6 million straight away that's saved. Now, we haven't even looked further to see if there are other savings. But my bet is that within the salaries area, there is. We pay uh, well above market rates uh, in our wages in this organisation. And I thank the Lord Mayor for pointing out in his uh, email to us that our wages bill is $70.5 million. Um, but those savings I mentioned would more than offset any uh, uh, growth in average weekly earnings. Now, I recognise that we're talking about public sector earnings, but even so here, 
we are paying an extraordinary number of people more than $100,000 a year, somewhere around about 20%. About a third of them are getting something in excess of what you would get if you were working for the state government. That is, they are earning more than average weekly earnings for public sector workers. So we've got this massive cost base. Now, I, I don't deny our staff their wages. They're entitled to them. They're entitled to negotiate whatever they can get. But we don't seem to be as good at it as we could be. That's why we've got such a large cost base. Now, I uh, refer you to um, uh, the uh, long-term financial plan. You have 20 seconds, Councillor. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I, know, I know you like to sum up properly. So. Yeah, okay, that's very good of you. Uh, well, let me just move on and say that in, in the scenario that's put before you, there is a proposed increase of more than is considered reasonable in the LGA, more than you were considering previously, and yet we have not attacked the efficiencies that can be brought from within the organisation. We haven't even discussed that. So um, good on you, Councillor Milani. I, I agree with that proposal, but I also endorse absolutely Councillor Moran's proposal. It is the only sensible, decent thing to do for our rate players. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor uh, Deputy Lord Mayhander. Can I just ask a question first of all, because I think that um, Councillor Martin raises an interesting point. The, can you can you explain why you chose the Adelaide CPI as opposed to the LGA? Because I've heard that a couple of times. I just I'd like to understand that. The, through the chair, the, the local government price index is only a historical index. It's uh, it's based on what's oh, happened in the you. past. There's no science around what that might be in oh, the future. Uh, there's no estimations of what that might be in the future. Uh, what we're trying to do in terms of budget planning is provide you with some uh, science behind the, the inflation estimate, I guess. Um, there's options if uh, Council didn't want to. It, it, we can still link to a CPI measure. Uh, you could link to 1% less than CPI if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to achieve a particular outcome. Uh, but trying to provide a stable basis of estimating into the future and, and go from that from a principal's perspective rather than uh, uh, come in the air type perspective. Thank you. Can I, I just wanted to make some comments about the impact of, um, I mean, obviously I'd like to support Councillor um, Moran's amendment, but on the impact of, of the amendment. And I just urge councillors to go back and think about last year when we were provided with some information by our property department, which indicated that we have got a very significant backlog of maintenance work to do in the city. And you might recall that we had a, we've been given a budget with 35 million, 35 million, you know, I don't know exactly what the figures are, but last year, this year, we've allocated 35 million to fix up our roads and footpaths. Not, this is not doing any new work. This is just doing maintenance work on our, on our essential infrastructure. In our long-term plan, we, we also, in the figures that were put to us last year, we allocated 38 million for next year, for next financial year. Now have a look. At paragraph 11, we've got an income coming in of 56.1, and we're going to take $38 million of that and spend it on roads and footpaths. It leaves us with very, very little money to do anything else. Let me finish. Let me finish. The um, One of the reasons we've got this significant backlog of, of work is because we haven't spent enough money on our city in previous years. That's a very clear advice that we got from our property department. This is a backlog, a catch up. Have a walk down Bank Street. Have a look at it. It is absolute disgrace. I can't, I tell you, one of these days when I ride my bike down Greenfield Street, I'm going to fall into a hole and never be seen again. I mean, it's actually dangerous to be on a push bike. There's a great skewed up in the city. I tell you, it's really dangerous. We have got a lot of work to do just to get our roads and footpaths up, up to scratch. And remember, that budget figure of 38 that we've been, you know, we were asked to consider a couple of last year when we were starting to work out how we're going to actually fix this huge backlog of work to do, that budget figure was like for like, like for like. And what we're saying is we've got a green agenda. So we don't want like for like. We want like for green. We want to actually take, take the opportunity to, to improve our streets, not simply replace them. And if we actually want to do those important things in our city, we have to sustain our income. 
we have to make sure that we're not going backwards. Now, with this, freezing the dollar, that means that our income will make, from rates will remain exactly the same because we're not going to do a, a, a what's the word, a, 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 a re-evaluation. So our income from rates will, will remain exactly the same. If no, inflation it goes up, it won't stay the same. It'll increase by one percent. Oh, well, sorry, no, I beg your pardon. No, you're absolutely right. It will increase only by that. In the meantime, our our expenses will go up, and effectively, we will be going backwards in terms of what we've got to spend. We'll be going backwards in terms of what we've got to spend at a time when we've been told that expenditure in our city on the basics are, are way behind, and we've got a backlog to fix up. If this is not the time to spend some money on our city. I don't know when it is. Fixing up a backlog, and we've got people coming in, and we're going to limit our income. I, I just don't know that. Well, we spend it on the big projects. Oh, well, if, to, just to make that point, my understanding is this year we have, um, we had a budget allocation of 35 million to spend on our, um, our uh, capital works, uh, on our um, asset management. And I've been, uh, advised by Mark today that we will, by the end of that year, we will, we will be very close to spending it. And, and unlike previous years where we've actually had a um, very significant carryover, this year that carryover is unlikely to happen because we haven't had any major projects to attend to at the same time. So we will spend that 35 pretty much that, this year. Can we get that clarified, please? Can we get clarity on that? Okay. Thanks through the chair. The, uh, in the QFT report that uh, the committee endorsed tonight for recommendation to council next week, uh, total carry forwards uh, are estimated to be $840,000 at this stage for asset renewals. For QFT? Uh, for the full year, that's the full year estimate at this point in time. Another cabinet spending it. Hand are you done? Yep, Councillor Malani, then the Lord Mayor. I've got to be brief on, on this particular option. I, I, said, I don't support this because it doesn't factor in CPI, doesn't factor in efficiencies on the flip side. Um, but I, I certainly don't um, support a status quo scenario. Um, and if you speak to the community, um, you know, you talk to the South West um, residents, they want us to increase um, investment in the public realm. They want us to um, spend money on that on assets to improve the amenity in, in which they live, the streets, the footpath, the lighting, etc. So we can't afford to go back with undergrounding, whatever whatever the um, it is. But so we certainly can't afford to go backwards. I, I'm in a dilemma that neither of these options provide the solution that I I think is appropriate. But I certainly can't um, support anything that doesn't factor in CPI at all. And this restricts even um, consideration of efficiencies. I think we... we no, it doesn't. We, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Councillors, yeah. please. You're, you're, we'll freezing the rate, you're freezing the rate in the dollar. You're welcome to call a point of order if you feel the I, I, um, I'm happy to clarify for you. How is the point of order? Our efficiencies ruled out by that motion. So it's not a point of order. It's a... You'd seek a clarification? It's a heckle. It, it, <laughs> it's a heckle, not a point of order. Um, so I, I certainly won't support a, um, this as it stands. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Look, I agree with the comments in terms of this being a principle-based discussion, and I think really we need to do this better. Yeah. Um, I think we should really have some guiding principles when it comes to the annual rate debate that sees us through every year. Because this is like Groundhog Day when it comes to the annual rate debate. Um, <clears throat> for the record, uh, yes, I did say that I was supportive. Some of them do have some guiding principles. No, I think as a religious that's a head on out. <laughs> yes, councillor. That should be slow. However, um, we are faced with two choices in front of us now. But <clears throat> the look, we we can do two things. Um, there are when, when times get a bit tough and absolutely in business and absolutely for our residents times are a bit tough. I don't think anyone denies that. When I do talk about the, the vacancy rate um, and the rentals, so the rentals which are falling, that's more regarding office space and more particularly regarding seeing D grade office space. It's not the entire market. But we are we gearing ourselves to enable growth in the city 
or are we going to set up a dynamic where we just get a batten down the hatches and ride out the storm? And I think that's the kind of principled discussion that we need to have as a council with regards to our budgeting. Can we catalyse some smart projects which um, generate sustainable revenue for our city, uh, bring more people to it, have more people investing in it? We can't always do that by sitting on our hands and doing nothing. We can't always do that by slashing and burning and cutting costs. And believe me, I've been a businessman for 30 years. I'm, I know how to cut costs. But is that the right thing to do as a capital city council? Is that the right thing to do now? Right? We recognise it's tough. I don't think anyone debates that. But I think we need to sing a little bit of a different tune. The, we absolutely have to continue, no matter what we do, to address this backlog, uh, backlog, backlog of essential infrastructure. $35 million a year plus, we've just got to keep doing it because we're playing a catch-up game. But I think we need to do more. Uh, I think we do need to, and I do look forward in due course bringing to the members, and you can, uh, you can assess these on their merit, but I think we might need to entertain some larger capital intensive pro um, projects to stimulate the city. You know that we have to look at the central market arcade and the central market. You know that. That's going to be a cost to us, no matter what we do. Whether we just do a master plan and hand it over to the private sector, or whether we get involved financially, you know it's going to have a cost for us. I'm a little worried, members, about what I would call institutionalising no rate growth. Because I think there's an opportunity cost associated with that decision making. I just encourage you to think about that. Um, I am leaning towards option one. I don't think it's perfect. I don't think it's perfect. For many of the reasons that Councillor Milani has uh, suggested, I don't think it's perfect. But I think it's a reasonable compromise, which recognises that it is tough out there for our ratepayers. It recognises that we have some uplift. I mean, last year we thought we had $3 million of new rates revenue. We ended up with two. So we didn't get what we thought we had. Mark, I hope, has been conservative, is now estimating something around a million. I hope he's been conservative. But we don't know. We don't know when it's going to fall due, I'd imagine. Do you want to answer that question, Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm using the best information I've got with that uh, one there through the chair. Understand. So, members, th uh, this is a principal debate. I would prefer us to lock ourselves away for three hours in a workshop to sort these things out in terms of how we're going to sort rates for the next four years or the next seven years together. So we have some principles, which we just pull out the principles every year and say they're the guiding principles for our rate discussion. So. I do encourage you to think, are you going to pull your, put your head like in the sand, batten down the hatches and slash costs when times are a little bit tough? Or are we going to catalyse some projects that stimulate growth in the city? I must say, I am of the latter persuasion. And that's going to cost us a few dollars. That may cost our ratepayers a few dollars. But I think option one, and I'll reserve my right to make that decision, I think option one gives us a happy compromise. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Council Walker. Uh, yes, I remember speaking with our CEO after we uh, debated this last time and also a very quick conversation with um, David Slum, who's not here tonight. The CEO indicated to me that the norm is um, that you get CPI plus growth. So if there are new developments in a council area, that is for the benefit of all ratepayers, as it's growing the pie. So there is more money because there's more residents, there are more costs in servicing those residents. But that should really be our, as the City of Adelaide and the ratepayers, benefit the fact that there's been development and growth in the city. It should mean that there's, we've got more money to do stuff with. Um, and that's not costing any particular ratepayer money because it's just, the pie is just getting bigger because because the development's happening. I don't like it's it, the development's upset. happening. Um, then um, David Slama uh, said that, and he's very in touch with you know, business operators in the East End and stuff like that, no one, no one flinches at CPI. No one flinches at CPI. So, um, uh, you know, the rate in the dollar, you know, I'm, I'm, I agree with, you know, we should be seen, being seen to, you know, not making an extra grab, but basically, I think Councillor Megan spoke very well with her recommendation to option one that you know you achieve that CPI through the growth, and then you only do that if if that doesn't keep, keep track. So that the um, thing. So you know, having sort of considered all these things, I'm at this point in time inclined to to support Megan's original 
uh, option one on this uh, on, on this call. Um, we do have things that we want to do. It doesn't preclude us from uh, and the CEO getting efficiency dividends that I know Councillor Martin's trying to achieve. The, you know, a better um, way we do things. So it doesn't doesn't preclude that still being achieved. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to support that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Virtual. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm also inclined to uh, support option one, mainly because it's it's been my experience where we haven't done small incremental raises or rises, that what happens is a few years down the track, we do very large increases to try and accommodate long-term financial plan because we don't actually then have the incomes to do the projects that we need to do or to, to maintain the services that we need to maintain with the residential growth. Um, I think that looking at that, there will be, it depends what the uplift is and it also depends again which rate we're going to use, whether we're using the Treasury rate, the uh, September 15 rate or the LGA rate. Um, because that will determine whether we actually freeze the rates um, so that we just use the uplift or whether we do a, a nominal increase um, to make sure that we adjust in line with CPI. Um, the other thing I think would be great if we can address Councillor Moran's um, uh, comment that we haven't revisited the valuations for two years and ask when that may be happening again. Thank you. Thank you. That was through the chairs, yeah, certainly we uh, we are including that in the budget for uh, 16, 17 to refresh evaluations across the board. Councillor Corbell. Um, yeah, look, I don't support this. I've got like real concerns around the long term financial implications, and we um, we froze the rate in the dollar last year. I actually didn't support that. I was one of the three councillors that didn't support it. Why? Because when I went door knocking, I didn't actually do it on like freezing the rates in the dollar. I did it on um, what the changes that I saw in the city. The things that excited me as a young person living in the city, as a young professional, the changes that I'd seen. I, I like the major infrastructure projects. I want us as a council to be able to invest into these sorts of things in the future. I recognise we've got core business, our asset renewals, we need to, there's been a lot of neglect over the years. We need to be able to deliver on that in addition to these exciting um, major projects and smaller discretionary um, projects and initiatives. I want us to have money for all of that. I don't support this because I think it's going to put us in a situation of being too lean and um, it's going to be at the chopping block of some of the, the things that I want to see happen. And I think he's good for the city of the, for the city and for future growth and will attract investment to the city of Adelaide. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Any other councillors? Councillor Fira. Look, I I think that option one was half reason, half reasonable. However, when I think about you know the extra uplift and the extra revenue that gives provides for the city for, for other projects, I'm thinking, well, yeah, why should we increase the rate in the dollar for the residents? I when I before I went away at Christmas, the weeds in front on my footpath were this high and they remained there until I got back. I've lived in my house for over 40 years. There are tourist buses going up and down my street. I'm the one that sweeps the gutter. I'm the one that plants underneath the trees. I'm the, I, I pay for someone to come and look after the, to mow the lawn, to keep the place tidy. Fair enough, that's part of the agreement for the virgins. My house is 5.9 metres wide. It costs me a fortune to go to the toilet compared to other people living in other suburbs because of the valuation or the rental value of my property. If people thought, if people thought around there that they were actually getting something to show that warranted the increase, I wouldn't mind. But what we have got are people whose, whose rates have gone up, and I cite myself, 30%. I've done nothing to my house in the last 40 years, apart from a coat of paint. She hasn't. And my other neighbours, <laughs> my other neighbours, you know, well, my other neighbours have spent money on 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 
renovations. For the tourists. But because I'm part of one of five, our system of rating is so, the tool is so blunt. It is such a blunt tool that some people are actually being punished for where they live. And I would have to say, I'm not seeing, I'm not living on the doorstep of Victoria Square or the market. I live quite a distance away. There's nothing being spent on O'Connell Street. So, you know, why is it that, that we're continually being asked to pay huge increases in our rates when we're not seeing anything of any significance happening in that area? Okay. Um, may I just seek leave to just make a couple of comments? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I need to. It's important. I think this is an important process to be involved in just briefly. Look, I don't... Um, <laughs> I honestly think this whole process is flawed. We're doing it in complete reverse. I mean, the first thing I would like to know is what uh, what do we need to do to bring everything up to speed and spec in our city over the next 10 years? And I understand very clearly that every year we need 20 million or 30 million dollars to be able to get standard A, standard B, or standard C. Uh, and on that basis, we need to project a CPI increase of that type, or an over CPI increase, or a borrowing, or an investment, or an increase in car park, whatever it is. I just think we're doing this completely in reverse. We're trying to determine what set of profit or incomes we want to we want to get in before we understand how we're going to spend it either, and that's part of the challenge. So look, I don't um, I, I don't support this specific motion, but I also don't support option one or two. Um, I think this needs, um, as we discussed before, it's still missing the long-term financial plan and discussion. We're still focusing on year by year. Uh, we're still not seeing clearly what our expenditures are going to look like, and if I agree if expenditure is going to be discussed first and we're going to find $2 million in efficiencies, then why increase the rates? Oh, we, should, we should press that. We should have the discussion in reverse. And by the time we get to the point of making a decision on rates, we've already known we've done everything in our power to make sure we reduce every bit of cost in the administration, make sure that we've eliminated any projects we don't want to do or projects we want to do. Uh, and then after that, we decide how to set the rate of the dollar, what CPI increase, or potentially what borrowing we need to do, or what efficiency dividends we need to achieve. At the moment, I feel like we're flying blind. We're trying to set uh, an income level that's going to set our expenditure, where I think we need to do it in reverse. We do have an obligation under the City of Adelaide Act and also under the Local Government Act to deliver a minimum level of service that I think we haven't delivered for a very long time uh, in relation to capital works in the city. And that's something we need to look at. So look, I think this needs to be done in reverse. The way we're going about it, it's completely wrong. And I'll hand over to Councillor Moran. Okay. Uh, look, I, I take exception to the Lord Mayor's comments that, we, that, that, that this motion um, and other comments too is basically sticking our head in the sand, locking it down, being an austere council. No, it's not. Uh, we, we by, by freezing the rate in the dollar, we force ourselves to go out and find the money elsewhere. I looked at all your electoral material last night because I keep it so I can copy it. Mine is the freezing the rate in the dollar. No, I don't object to that. When you say to people that you get their votes and then you go and you argue the opposite, that really gets up my nose. Yes, I do. And it's not making it on yours either, actually. This forces the council to become agile, mean and nimble, nimble, to thought leaders to decouple from the rates. On a serious note, to say that the long term plan and to forecast do, and by the way, I'm calling it a vision. Doom and gloom in the foot. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this financial year. We will argue the next financial year then. This is short term. I take your thumbs point, but, but still, you still get down to the, even if you vote green, you've got to get down to a major party eventually. So you've got to work out whether you want to put the rates up by putting the rate up in the dollar or encouraging new development. Now, um, uh, Priscilla, you may have spoken to your community today and wanted more stuff done. Who doesn't? But then did you say, look, we can do a bit more stuff, a tiny bit more stuff, um, by slugging you for more rates? I suspect that your rate powers said, no, why don't you get more efficient? Why don't you get your businesses running? Oh, they, well, they wanted to have their rates put up, did they? I've never met such a rate payer, not recently anyway. 
Um, so we're not slashing and burning, we're not sticking our heads in the sand. We are forcing this big, fat juggernaut of an organisation to find the money elsewhere and not bleed dry further our ratepayers. We've got high rates, they're higher than any other comparable, and I'm talking mainly about residents. You've already said that the, your, your business guys are going down the gurgle and their rents are failing. <laughs> do not do this. It is not, not worthy of you. It is not worthy of you to do this. It is an insect, a small amount of money that we could raise by perhaps le letting the aquatic centre go to another entity. We can find the money elsewhere. You're the people with your heads in the sand. You're the people that are slashing your bedding because you're just relying on our tiny little rate base to get to suck some more money out of, find them, rate them. Be, you're better than that. I, I know I'm going to lose this. I'm, I, I just could not be more disappointed in the people that I've, I've trusted their intellect for you to have such ridiculous comments like and, and denigrating something that wants to, the people that want to freeze the rate in the dollar, which is the right thing to do. And you, you're not going to do it. And I'm going to call a division and you, it, it is a bad day for the city council when it relies on things like that. And I'm, I'm very sorry that you think that way. Thank you, Councillor Moran. I put the amendment of Councillor Moran to you. All those in favour? All those against? That is lost, and I'm guessing there's a division call. Yeah. Those members go to in favour of the amendment, please rise. Councillor Moran, Councillor Clarehan, and Councillor Moran. With that, we go back to the substantive. Uh, any debate in relation to the substantive? Yes. With that, um, Deputy Lord Mayor, to sum up. Yeah, um, look, I understand there's some people who don't necessarily agree. Uh, this is not going to sort out people who just voted against um, uh, option one, but I understand there's some people who don't actually agree with option one. I'm talking about uh, the chair and uh, Councillor Malani. Bear in mind, this is not. Um, that we're locking this in. What we're doing is we're providing a draft, we're giving this as a key assumption so that our poor, long-suffering <laughs> finance department have got some something that they can apply so they can actually work out some figures for us. And um, and that's all that's going to happen with this information. It's going to, it's going to allow them to get started on a budget that we, of course, still have to approve and that we can make some further changes a, 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 about and so, if for example, Councillor Milani later wants to um, propose um, the the uh, additional um, income that she was uh, talking about in her when she when she spoke to um, this motion, then there's a, a, every opportunity to do that. I just wanted to make one far, further point though. Um, uh, I think it's a bit harsh for us to say to our administration what you need to do is go out and tell us what our long term plan is and then come back to us and tell us what we have to. Risk what we ought to be um, rating our, our um, uh, 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 everybody for, yeah. Um, in circumstances where I've done that in previous years and we've given them a belting. So what they did this time was they came to us first and said, what would you like your rate was income to be? And we've, you know, they, we asked them to do this, guys. We asked them to start with the rates and then work back and they've done exactly what we asked them to do. So I just want to acknowledge the work that they've done, thank them for the effort, and urge you to support this, at least to get started on a process. And then if we don't like it further down the track, and if it doesn't make our budget add up in the way we want it to add up, then we're going to change it. Thank you, Councillor. With that, I'll put option one to members. All those in favour? All those against? That is lost. <laughs> okay, can I see a show of hands? All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five. All those against? One, two, three, four. Where's Councillor Moran? Sorry, How does that work? So it's lost. So put your order in. Oh. Okay, so no, we're back. No, that's one. Like oh. Can we do that again? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Carry five to four. Yeah. 
Okay. I'm, I'm uncertain about that. Yes, it is. Yeah, very clear. Who will report it? You. Okay. I'm going to ask for this Alex again. And the chair. All those for the motion. Option one. Yep. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. All those against? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Oh, so. Is that yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, so there's an equality of votes, which means it, so it's, it's lost. lost. That's yeah. correct. So it's lost, which means we have a, what's it nothing to work on. So we have nothing before us again, members, on this issue. So, Lord Mayor, you want to move? I'd move to defer this to a workshop. Okay. Move to defer to a workshop to sort out guarding principles, oh. which uh, very quickly. Unless anyone has a better idea, I move that we take this to a workshop to sort out guiding principles for uh, rates for the next four years. All right. Do I Seconder. Second that. Councillor Wilkinson, any debate? Yeah. Councillor. I'd like some clarity, please. I mean, what, what is actually intended from this workshop? Well, Nothing. Lord Mayor. Same as the last meeting. Um, where, where, where's, where's it going to take us that this two hours of debate has not? Can I try something? Let's just hear the Lord Mayor first who's got a direct question. There's a motion on the floor, so I need to address that. Right. Uh, we are going to re we're going to repeat this process annually, of course. We have for the last two years. We'll do it for the next term, we'll do it for four after that. Um, and I would suggest that in the interest of building kind of a more reliable budget and having a more reliable budget process, we agree on some guiding principles for our rating. Uh, and unless we have a very good reason to change it, we stick by it for future years. That's why I suggest a workshop. Is this I'm correct, not the wording on the screen there for you? I'm not really the answer to what that workshop may be, um, Councillor Abel Chair, but the, the matter be taken to a workshop, um, I would say, with post haste to sort out the guiding principle, or to sort out, to determine the guiding principles for uh, rating, um, look, I would say in line with our 2020 strategic plan, to be honest, I would say through 2020. So let's get those words right first of all, then, please. Okay. The matter to take that into a workshop, workshop to determine the guiding principles for rating for in line with our strategic plan. In line with our strategic plan. For the next four years. Well, through to 2020. Through to 2020. 2020. Uh, Council Wilkinson, you happy with the change? So we don't have to have Groundhog Day every year. Okay. Uh, you're happy, you're satisfied with that answer, Councillor Martin? Uh, no, I'm not. May I speak to you or uh, is the Lord Mayor Well, the Lord Mayor's reserved his right at this stage. Uh, no, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll need a second if this is... That was already seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank so, you. happy. Uh, would you like to reserve your right, yeah, Councillor Martin? Right. Okay. So, so Councillor Martin, go ahead, you have the floor. Um, look, Chair, I, I, I understand, I have just witnessed uh, uh, pretty much a division of thought about this. Uh, and I cannot see that the kind of workshop that would be required is going to be able to be conducted and concluded in time for the budget process to be completed. Now, there are good debates to be had about this. Uh, I'm not saying in anything I say about freezing the rate in the dollar that rates should be frozen forevermore. And there's a good discussion to be had in council about whether, in fact, the mechanism for raising rates, that is rental valuation versus capital value, which applies in other places, not necessarily capital cities, is a better way to go in terms of the population mix of the city and the mix of rate payers. That's a good discussion to have. And that provides also the basis for the kind of automatic increases through some formula created by the Valuer General, that would obviate the need for Groundhog Day, as the Lord Mayor calls it. But honestly, that is a substantial debate. That is a workshop. That's something we can spend a day debating, the finer detail of, briefed with documents from the administration. Right now, all we have is an ideological difference. That is to say, an equal number are unhappy with both of the outcomes that have been put to us. Now, I can't see a solution to that, and in the absence of that, my view is that a more sensible approach is to adopt the view that this has failed as a, uh, a recommendation from the administration. In the absence of that, uh, we proceed on the basis of what um, uh, was the, the situation last year, that is that there is a freeze, but we have and agree to have 
No, no, hang on. Agree to have the more substantial and meaningful debate about the manner in which rating income is gathered. That is a good debate. That's that's a much better debate than we would sit here having uh, at a workshop on a Saturday with an outcome that we produce $1 million in extra revenue. That would be an enormous waste of everybody's time and a great expense. However, a workshop that clearly established a process quite separate from this would be a very good discussion. And so I'm suggesting to you that we simply revert to what was the practice last year, knowing that there are a range of changes. No, well, no, no. That's exactly what you Councilor, said. Councillor, no, Councillor Malani, please. Councillor Malani, Councillor Martins, please. 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 Councillor Malani, <laughs> Councillor Martins <laughs> to us before. Well, I'm just suggesting to you that the way forward is to have the... <laughs> Do a draft budget with that? Deputy Lord Mayor, please. Okay. Just allow okay. Councillor Martin to finish. Well, uh, I'm, I'm addressing uh, not, not the dilemma there, but the broader dilemma, the longer term argument. And I'm saying that's a good discussion. It cannot be had in the time that we have for this budget process. That needs to be expedited. And, and in my view, uh, uh, we simply revert to the position that existed before, knowing that that broader discussion that's coming will yield a result with which we can all live and will uh, form the, the matrix for the, the way forward. Is it possible Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, anyone else? Councillor uh, Deputy uh, Look, I, I'm just, I absolutely agree. With, let's have the big debate. But in the meantime, we've got to give our administration something that they can actually go away and start working out the budget for. And uh, and so I wonder whether, and I'm just seeking, um, seeking administration's view, whether we can have a budget that's got Option one, option two budget, or option one, option two, option three budget. Somehow you've got to have something to work on. Give us some advice about how you might make productively go forward, mate. Uh, through the chair, I'm, I'm happy to go away and build a budget based on a set of assumptions and bring back a draft budget to you for consideration. Um, the, the set of assumptions I'd use would be uh, similar to what we've recommended, but then obviously you'll have uh, the, the option to tweak those those, uh, those assumptions. And option three. But which option? Well, which your option to put option two options? That's what I was asking for tonight. Mm. So, yeah, <laughs> um, Checking, so put them both. I can put, you know, the the differences can uh, will be uh, relatively easily laid out in a in a, in a summary table at the end. Uh, the, the Councillors, what, the this motion right. that we have in front of us at the moment is for a workshop. That's the motion we have. So please, let's just try to speak to that. Councillor Malani. I just wanted to ask on, on that, further to Megan's question. Can we not, can we, that would have a stop doing list in it, option one versus option two, if you take those assumptions. Why can't we do that, actually? Well, that would need to come to a workshop, I'm guessing. You know, we have a workshop motion in front of us. Please, members, speak to the well, motion. Can we, but can we just give, give, to give the clarity, we still the workshop. We, 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 we're workshopping, actually, option one versus option two, okay. and what we have to stop doing so between those two budgets. You may need to take into account to bring to the workshop. Are you prepared to take that on notice? Uh, through the chair, uh, if we're seeking a, uh, a workshop in the next very soon, short period, then I don't think that's achievable. Yeah. Uh, that's we can, as we've done in previous years, bring back a list of ranked projects and uh, where you set the rate in the dollar or where you set the rates revenue will determine where the, the line goes up and down on okay. the list. So the most, my suggestion then is that we don't do a workshop. We could do the guiding principles. We've got to do that sometime you anyway. Can speak but against we can, it, Councillor. Well, um, that's what I'll do then. But we can do option one versus option two and just say, let's do the budget that way. And and then we'll, we'll look at what we have to stop doing between the two options. Fundamentally, I believe the Lord Mayor's concern is to address some policy decisions and guiding principles around our rights um, in the long term as well. So I think the workshop will address that and may also address some of the concerns that you brought on board. And I believe Mark Sack will take on those. Yeah. Any other debate in relation to having or not having a workshop? Lord Mayor, sum up. Thanks, Chair. I, I, I'm defaulting to a workshop, 
by virtue of the fact that we can get a one a solution for 16, 17 year, but also get us some clarity together through to 2020. We have a strategic plan. We may as well marry a few more things up to our strategic plan so that we have more certainty as a group or as a council, as an administration for the next four years. So uh, you will hear us, you will hear me uh, this year talk many, many times about our strategic plan because our strategic plan is our source code. That will should inform the vast majority of the decisions we make. So when it comes to rates, if we get together, we have a workshop, we can focus exclusively on unlocking a solution for 16, 17, and as importantly, determining what uh, differences of opinion or uh, um, uh, uh, agreements is with regarding rates policy. Let's do that and then hopefully make the process a lot easier next year and the year after that and the year after that through to 2020. So I commend you to all workshop members. Members, I'll put that. All those in favour? Members, can I get a show of hands? All those in favour of the workshop? All those against? Thank you, councillors. Members, we move on to item um, item 11 end of quarter one uh 2015-16 great business plan if i can get a mover moved by the deputy lord mayor seconded seconded by councillor martin deputy lord mayor you have the floor move as is uh nothing any debate in relation to this item be it that there's none to sum up i'll put that all those in favor all those against, that item is carried. Members, we move on to item um, 12, out of session uh, paper. Anyone to move? Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Seconder, Councillor Wilkinson. Any debate or discussion? Summed up? I'll put that, all those in favour, all those against. That is carried. We move on to item 14, which is exclusion of the. Excuse public. me, Chair. There's other oh, sorry, I apologise. Other business, yes. I have a, a question without notice. Go ahead, Councillor. Of the administration. If there is now to be a workshop to determine rate increases and the strategic plan is to be, uh, or they're to be included in the strategic plan. Does this now mean that the strategic plan will not be presented to Council on the 23rd of February for approval? Through the Chair, the intention is for the strategic plan to be tabled at the um, February meeting. Uh, and my question is, given that we now have a workshop on rates which will inform the strategic plan, will the strategic plan be approved before the workshop to inform the strategic plan? Through the Chair, just to remind Council, the strategic plan is being tabled to, for Council's consideration to go to public consultation. We're not, we're not suggesting that the strategic plan will be adopted as the plan of Council is to, is to consult on only this. Okay, no, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other business? Yet that there's none, I move on to item 14, exclusion to consider item 15. Quarter two business operation report 15 16 December year to date. I move that, Chair. Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Any debate? All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. If we could please have the doors closed and also the um, camera. I uh, will conclude this item and not seek to reopen the doors. That's where we have to let close. And uh, I declare the Finance and Business Services meeting closed at 9.26 pm. Thank you, members.